Okay, then we just got it. Thank you. Okay, meeting is recording. All right, good morning, everyone. How are things getting in order? We're in Missoula today. Wonderful, beautiful Missoula Public Library. Um, my name is Tim Harwich. I'm the chair of the State Library Commission and the Higher Education Committee. If I can help the other commissioners uh, introduce themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor, from Whiteman. Robin Scribner from Geraldine, and I want you to know this is a magnificent facility, and the young men are cleaning 400 windows on the top two levels. It's <laughs> incredible. The view is incredible. Hi, good morning. Donald Johnson from Missoula. I'm Tammy Hall from Northern. Um, we have a couple of commissioners online. Kristen? Kristen Kerr from Helena, Montana. Good morning, everyone. This is Superintendent Elsie Arntzen. And if I could ask a, a microphone to be passed around so that we can equally hear each of you, if that capability is still there, that would be great. Thank you. I couldn't hear you. I'll ask Jenny to introduce herself. Good idea. We're going to make one quick adjustment to see here. Well, it's picking it up from this snowball, so I don't know if being together. Oh, you we were going to go around. Okay, yep. There's Dave. Okay. I would just so speak as loud as you can. Henning was the only one I had difficult hearing. <laughs> Kenny, can I ask maybe an idea? Why don't Kenny and Robin switch so that you are sitting close to it? I think you have the. So you can't. Stop. I don't you can't there you see go. Ken. Oh, there. there you go. Is it okay? So, Kenny, do you mind moving it so that you're next to the microphone and it might give everyone at home? Sorry. Sorry. Jenny, did you introduce yourself? Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenny Staff. I'm the Montana State Librarian. And I, too, want to congratulate the Missoula Public Library, especially for their fantastic and well-deserved award from the uh, International Federation of Library Associations recognizing this as the, the best library building in the world last week. What a wonderful honor. Amazing. All right. <clears throat> um, we will move right into the uh, consent agenda. Um, these are these consist of the minutes and the collection development policy from the Montana Memory Project that we uh, discussed at our last meeting. So I would entertain a motion for the consent agenda. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion about the consent agenda? Okay, hearing none. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. The consent agenda passes. Elsie, is this better? Can you hear me better? Thank you, Kenny. Of course I can. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, Next, we will move into the Director's Institute update. And Tracy Cook will give us a summary. Tracy, you might want to stand up from here. Yes, Can you hear me okay, Superintendent Artson and Kristen? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, I do have a soft voice. I think all of you know me, but just uh, as a quick refresher, I'm Tracy Cook, and I'm the lead consulting and learning librarian at the State Library. And Jenny asked me to kind of talk a little bit more about the Directors Institute. I attended that with uh, several other staff and, of course, about 25 of the public library directors in Montana. And a lot of what came out of that is informing our work, particularly my work in this. I wanted to share with you some of the challenges that they mentioned and kind of what we are doing. I don't, I think many of the challenges are ones you actually see even as commissioners and in your own work. Um, it's just an interesting time that we live in, that is for sure. 
So some of the things they mentioned was a real desire to build better relationships with their local government officials to kind of truly understand what it is that their commissioners, the clerks, and city council members and mayors are facing and what they are doing in their roles and how that relates with the library. So I am actually working with the Montana Association of County Officers, and I've reached out to the local government center at MSU. And then I hope to reach out to the League of Cities and Towns. And really long term, I'm hoping to do some partnership trainings with them, kind of focusing on just understanding each other's roles and how libraries interact with local government and how they fit within that ecosystem. I am teaching uh, three fall workshops. Of course, you would be welcome to attend. I'm going to be in Sydney, Missoula, and Lewistown uh, talking about this. And then I'll also be giving a, a, I don't know that I'd call it a training. It's more like having a conversation during the elected officials training in December in Helena, and that's for county commissioners. So those are some of the ways that I'm working on that particular issue. I know the librarians are also working on it as well. The second one is one that I think any business, nonprofit, and government are facing is the cost of living has increased pretty significantly. And so people are struggling to keep staff or to hire new staff. And so this is one that the Network Advisory Council sent to you earlier this year, a real desire to do a salary survey to see if there is a way to increase wages for library staff and library directors as well. And then the third one, the censorship, that's been in the news a lot lately. Um, there were just some concerns from librarians, um, definitely a uh, realization that it's extremely important for people to be able to speak up about materials that are in the library. I think their worry is more just some of the, the legislation they have seen. And, and I think, unfortunately, we've seen this and many of you may have experienced it. Sometimes um, people are not as polite as one would wish when they're making their, wish, their concerns heard. And so there's a lot of stress that comes with that as well. And then the remaining two really have to do, I think, with just some more foundational long-term work is just educating people about libraries and their value. And then we have continue to have more new directors coming in and they have a desire to connect with one another. And so a lot of this work is being done um, by the Montana Library Association. I would say we at the State Library are focusing mainly on that building relations with local government officials. Um, but we have certainly connected people with some of the resources about handling book challenges and then also um, working with MLA, I hope, to kind of continue to educate and advocate for libraries as well. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, Robin. Um, I do. I was wondering, um, reading through this, reading through the different manuals, I was wondering, is there protection for the trustees in some way? Mm -hmm. Yep. So in the Montana Code annotated, um, trustees fall under that protection that they are not liable if they're making a decision in good faith. Um, and actually that would cover you as well. Um, however, many libraries do have, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of errors and emissions insurance for their boards, as do a lot of local government officials that further protects them as well. Um, and also, this is just a question, um, and I think that you know the answer, but do we as commissioners um, have the authority to, or not authority, but ability, permission to be asked by, by county commissioners, by trustees, and by skin, is it possible for us to give, in good faith, mm -hmm. is it possible, it's possible to give advice that way? Yeah, I'm not surprised that you would be asked by them. I mean, that's certainly a role that you play. And I don't know if Jenny wants to kind of speak up to this. Do you want to go ahead? Okay. Um, what is super helpful is um, myself and Pam Henley and Suzanne Reimer work very closely with the public libraries is for you to connect with us um, and then kind of talk through it together. And the main reason for that is just that we make sure we're all giving a consistent message. Um, but it's definitely your role that okay. you're going to hear from and, people. And I guess my question also mm -hmm. is, is it best for me to talk to you to get a consistent message across? That would be the best way to do it. Is, is that your advice? I'm just... Yeah. Just... You know, I find it super helpful. Um, 
I, I will admit when I'm working with the libraries. Yeah. Do you remind us how many people attended uh, the Directors Institute and how many people expressed these uh, concerns? Yeah, so there were about 25 directors at the Institute. There's 82 public libraries, and they all kind of expressed um, many of these concerns, I would say. We did have some long-term directors who obviously the new director one didn't apply to them. And then also in our travels, um, Pam, Suzanne, and I work one-on-one -on -one with the libraries quite a bit. And I don't think any of these were surprised based on our site visits with the libraries and conversations. So I would say it is kind of a big concern across the state. Is there for, I know that's what you were doing, yeah. but is there training with the county commissioners, the board, uh, the library boards, and the librarians to understand what's micromanaging, what, how we get along, how we communicate, evaluating each other, or do we have a nice comfortable process like that that they can go through as the three together? Yeah, that's my dream. Um, I think it happens in some places. I know that, for instance, you're going to hear from Dan Clark this afternoon. Right. He will come to counties, and it is always open to library boards and any other boards and the county commissioners to meet together. But, but that is my dream to get to a place where we're doing that. A training. Yep. Yeah. Together. Yeah. yeah. Working together for the community. Yeah. I don't want to ignore you, Kristen and Superintendent Artson. Do either of you have any questions for me? I do not, but thanks so much for your presentation, Tracy. You're welcome. Right. Any further questions? Sure. Tracy, I, I have a question. Um, working in the local government, I do see there's curiosity and conflict when we try to bring forward understanding and incorporating the public. In what ways can you see the commission aiding you in this work? The State Library Commission? Correct. Yeah. Um, well, I would definitely say library boards look to you as a model. Um, that is for sure. And so certainly seeing how you might handle conflict or how you work through disagreements is pretty critical. Um, it also, I would say it really is valuable when one or more of you attends a training that these board members are at. Um, it really helps them see you as people and um, relate to you as peers. And that's why I don't think it's a bad thing when a board member reaches out to you because it's a similar experience, you know. So I think that's um, very helpful as well. Please, can you say, tell us John where they can be from as well? Yeah, um, they're going to be at uh, Sydney, Newstown, and Missoula. And I actually brought the flyer talking Perfect. to Dan so I can show you that. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's another way that would be helpful. I would say um, other ways maybe is definitely, I guess, continuing to support us in seeking out these partnerships with MAKO and the League um, and Local Government Center. Um, I know, for instance, the League, I think, is just swamped, but I've struggled to connect with the League. And, you know, that's something, if you have a connection that maybe could help me reach them, that would be great. That's another way. So have you had presentations at Maple? Um, this will be my first with Maple. I've worked closely with them for years, um, but usually it's in a one-on-one -on -one situation where we call each other. This will be like, this situation's going on in this community. How can we coordinate so that we're getting a good response? That's particularly important, I think, with personnel management and the budget. I think it's great that you're yeah. That's excellent. Yeah, they're a really good group. One of my concerns was mm -hmm. when I was on the school board, one of the first things I learned was that we, we have no power. We don't represent the library commission unless we're sitting here as a group. Individually, we are not commissioners out there. We are only when we're here. So if people contact us with concerns or complaints on the library staff, being a library staff somewhere or dealing with library some, somewhere, mm -hmm. um, I think it's easy for us to make our head library look dumb by not telling her what's going on out there. It's easy for her to make us look dumb by not telling us what's going on out there in India. 
And so because we have a mutual trust, I, I think if people contact us with concerns, you have to start with, um, I, I would be in touch with Jenny and we'll let her know what would be the next step. And I always keep that going. Would you agree? Yeah, I like, I like Tracy was saying that kind of consistent message, yeah. keeping us informed, keeping you informed if you're hearing absolutely those open lines of communication are, are really essential for us to help mitigate these challenges and have a consistent message and uh, try to provide the best support that we can. Yeah. I you are in a tricky situation when you're it contacted because you know sometimes people are looking for an answer and if you don't have all of the story it can be you don't know which answer is correct right right and it takes more than that you're getting one side yeah that's, exactly that that's why i try to talk to all everybody the library board the director everybody get the story full story right <laughs> yeah you get a, you have a full story but we can't yeah yeah you know, yeah and, and you're always welcome to just refer them to uh to jenny and then she'll know which consultant they have and can say could you follow up on this you know but i also understand you're in your communities like it's i know true. robin's in her community and they're her friends and it's true. colleagues yeah so it's but true, but it's true. Time, if you try to be um, you know follow through and talk to you Mm -hmm. I think this is understood, but people in your communities might not understand that the State Library Commission doesn't have any kind of governing authority over only over the right. 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 So, so making sure that when people are asking you questions, they understand that you may be able to provide advice or direction, answers, but but in no way are we providing any kind of governing authority or responsibility to the library. And but it's much the same with the school district because I can't, a teacher might call me, but I would have to explain to them that there is a superintendent principal in the community. Mm -hmm. And I, I I was saddened when I read that the number one concern here was this tension yes. between library boards and between, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know, personally, I think that's a lack of, of training and materials available. Um, one of the things we finally developed um, on the school board that I, I helped develop, and I don't mean that arrogantly, I apologize, it just was my concern, yeah. because I was getting all the calls, and I was in that difficult position, and we developed a process that I would say, I would love to send you, I got immediately out of drop your home or whatever, we will begin a concern, and it wasn't a complaint, it was a concern, mm -hmm. and the person would write back the best understanding and sign it, and it was all dated that it had to be completed within 30 days. And it would then go to the person in authority. So if it was teacher would go to principal, because principal goes to the superintendent. The principal was calling me, it went to the superintendent, but it would go to that person. They had 30 days to give. And I would always say, look, I would like to hear this and get involved in this. But the last step in this process is the school board. And if I'm walking through this with you, I have to accuse myself when it comes time yeah. and I'm assuming you're calling me because you believe that I'm there so why would you want me not to be able to take part in the process when it comes to us and you know usually you have people say um okay let's start that I'll sign it or I don't want anybody to know I don't want to do that I'm going to sign it and I say I can't carry it for you you can't carry it for someone you know, it's just not, I have no power out there to carry for. So it wouldn't hurt the libraries to have that mm -hmm. when parents come in, whatever. Yeah, and many of them do, actually. I think the tension, we, some of the tension may be a lack of understanding of the roles and the authority. Um, but I think some of it, too, is just, it truly is a stressful time in our world. And county commissioners and city council members, and you know it too, there are so many challenges coming at you and they never seem to stop. And it's hard not to just get tired. Every and I think that that leads to some of the tension too. I never get tired. Yeah, so. 
So this is Elsie, and I just want to say thank you, Tracy. Uh, in my conversations with the community as I do my state travels up in the Flathead, you were very instrumental in healing some bridges or building bridges within the community, the county commissioners, the trustees, the foundation that's there um, as well. And I, I, I think taking that opportunity to say thank you is really important to your, your view. It also brings out that we are a local control state. So something that may happen in the Flathead in the Northwest region of our state may be different than what happens in the central Southwestern part. But I believe the actions that we've got here with these bullet points do allow control. I wanna just caution our commission to not get too heavy handed to try to want to fix everything. But if we can allow a platform for people to pull down an understanding of their roles or understanding what um, their government world looks like, then that local control can occur. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you, Superintendent Artson. Anything else? Thank you, Tracy. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Pam Henley is going to uh, talk to us about the Excellent Library Services Award Resolution, and this is an action item. Thank you. Can everyone online hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, this is just kind of a routine thing that we traditionally we come to the commission with the resolution to um, pass that we can hand out the excellent library services award to the libraries who applied to it. This year we did change the criteria on the award so libraries filled out an application that they met certain criteria and they put in some narrative statements about the excellent services that they've been providing. So it was pretty exciting to read some of the things that people are doing. I was really happy to see a lot of these applications. So we have 36 libraries that um, we're, we would like to give the Excellent Library Services Award to, and we're asking you to approve that resolution. Questions for Pam? May I have a motion to approve this resolution? This is Kristen. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. Thank you, Kristen. Second. I'll second it. Thanks, Robin. Any further discussion? It's exciting. Yes, how it's wonderful. It's so wonderful. Thank you. I'm just so proud of you. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, the resolution passed. Thank you. Thank Pam. you. We'll be doing those at the award ceremony. Thank you. Okay, uh, Network Advisory Council report. So, and I, I am joined online by Jody Moore, the uh, chair of the Network Advisory Council. If there's any questions, uh, there's a couple of action items, but before we get to the action items, I wanted to just draw your attention to information that we provided during a Network Advisory Council retreat that we held on July 14th. Um, I think it's important that part of the work of the Network Advisory Council and the core service committees that we work with to help us keep an eye to future opportunities and challenges that are shaping our teachers' needs the types of library services that we're offering and particularly those core services that we support from the state library. And uh, thinking about the impacts of the future is really kind of a practice. First, we have to take time to dedicate to thinking in a more future focused and strategic way. And uh, there are ways in which we can incorporate a more futurist mindset into our thinking and planning. And as I said, it really needs to become a practice that we are engaging in and that we're encouraging our partners to engage in. And in order to support that effort, we brought in a consulting firm called Hedge from the Future School to guide us in some training and how we can think about 
different scenarios that are impacting our wor world, uh, things like changes in technology, changes in demographics, and other kinds of things, and how we can then um, go through exercises to think about what those changes might mean for our library services in the near term, five years, and 10 years, even in 20 years. And with this kind of learning, our hope is that we will continue to challenge ourselves to be future focused so that we have an opportunity to be more proactive in thinking about the services that we're offering. Uh, so the, the retreat was really a first step in building that practice. And I shared the slides with you from that workshop. Are there any questions about the retreat? Or, and Jody, if you have anything you wanted to share, please feel free. Thanks, Jenny. I just wanted to chime in and let everybody know on the commission how much the retreat was appreciated. It was incredibly energizing for those of us that um, took part in it. And um, the trainers did such an excellent job. It was also a great opportunity coming off of a few years of um, virtual and canceled events to meet some of the faces and names that you knew but hadn't had a chance to um, be in the room with. So I really appreciate the State Library staff for putting that together and um, for the commission for supporting that, that effort as well. So thank you. The second item from the NAC report is another action item to look at the virtual programming policy. This is a policy that the commission considered as a draft at your June meeting. And there was some discussion around the language in the policy about accessible programming. And so at the request of the commission, staff researched different kinds of accessibility best practices for how to provide virtual online programming uh, in ways that are most acceptable. Uh, and Amelia Kim is here and available to answer any questions that you might have. Um, she reached out to sources such as the Disability Rights Montana, the National Disability Rights Network, and the Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium to identify different kinds of ways in which we can ensure that we're doing our best to provide those uh, programs using things like accessible PowerPoints, closed captioning that we're doing here in this meeting, potentially even offering American Sign Language services, etc. So the intent is that um, with this policy, we will also include a checklist that we will use and that libraries can use as a way to ensure that within the available resources, we're doing the best that we can to ensure accessibility to the virtual programming. Um, with that additional information, the Network Advisory Council recommends that the Commission adopt the virtual programming policy. And that was my only question was, does the actual thing we're adopting, because some of this said they recommended, but does what we're adopting actually say as resources allow? Because a lot of the libraries would love to do this, but they just don't have the resources. So it's very clear if we prove this that it's as as resources allow. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I, I noticed that was on the page one, but I wasn't sure it was on the final camera. Okay. So I wonder. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve the virtual programming policy? If I could, Kenny, just for a moment. Do you have the policy, Genevieve, that you could put up on the screen for us, please? And I believe what I would like in this then is uh, go through this. And I don't know if you have a red line version of what we looked at in our previous meeting to it's see, you know, the differences between. Yeah, it's in the agenda, Elsa. If that could also be pulled up. What I'm looking at is we have an advisory committee and we want to honor them. We also have a commissioner that sits on this, which is Dalton. But I firmly believe that as a commission, 
we want to make sure that we thoroughly vet what is being what we're being advised to, because there could be repercussions out into the field or out into um, any other uh, entities. Such as? Well, I'm OK, so we do have a red line version here. And that is in or that is out. So here's the, this is what is in. That's what's in. Okay. That the underlined is what is in. And the cross, the strike, struck out section is what was changed. So let me know which one you guys want up there, the final one or the end of the So the accessibility clause that I'm looking at here, uh, we have taken out applicable laws or standards and placed it with um, accessible best practices. It just seems to be uh, all, um, a different version of what we're attempting to do here for accessibility. If I may, Superintendent, at the June meeting, there were some questions about what those standards and laws might be. This language was um, based a little bit more around building accessibility rather than virtual programming accessibility. And so at the request of the commission, staff researched uh, these other institutions that provide virtual programming uh, and is incorporating their best practices so um, to the best of our knowledge, there really aren't a lot of specific laws around governing virtual programming in this way, but there are best practices that libraries can utilize in, in making sure that the, the technology allows for uh, as many people as possible to participate fully in the, that kind of programming. And so that's what drove this language change. Thank you, Denny. And so in our world in education, there seems there is an equivalency between uh, when we were thrust into uh, virtual education from when we were in a brick and mortar uh, discussion point. So I'm, I'm thinking that even though there may not be specific laws or uh, that or standards that may not be applicable specifically for virtual I would feel more comfortable if there was something that said that there's a lawful way, and maybe it's just my old legislator hat that I put back on, but I would like to protect the agency to make sure that we are indeed uh, mindful of any laws or any accommodation. It just seems, is it in another place maybe? Maybe there is something that is there mindfully dealing with the legality rather than in this certain clause. May I ask this? So we, with everything going virtual through COVID, are, the, are we catching up that we need um, standards and regulations for the, AD, for the ADA on the virtual? Is that what you're saying, Elsie? That we need, there are laws for accessibility for every other area, but were we behind on laws for this? And are we saying we're going to make up rules without laws? Is that what you're asking? Uh, no, I just think we need to be very mindful of the accessibility, whether it's virtual or on the ground or in person, traditional, however it might be. I just don't know. We have stripped out a clause that talks about standards and applicable laws, and there's nothing in the new language it may be somewhere else within the policy. I don't know. I just would like us as an agency to be uh, protected uh, in a, any kind of a, a illegality or a question that might come up. Is there a reason that they took out the laws and you're saying there are any laws, but are there solid? To my knowledge, I, I want to check with staff, there are not a lot of laws pertaining to the online environment and online participation. What what would it look like if we took the phrase uh, applicable laws and put it back in after uh, 
best practices for virtual programs to the extent that applicable laws and resources allow. Sorry, I was trying to gremlin walk over. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat that, Kristen? Yes. Um, the the phrase applicable laws what would it be like if we reinserted it back into the phrase uh after best practices for virtual programs to the extent that applicable laws and resources allow um i mean i i don't have a law background so i'm not really sure how that would stand up um from a legal perspective um, just in the research that I was doing, when I consulted with Disability Rights Montana, they did not send me any laws or anything. They sent me something from the National Disability Rights Network that was a best practices document. Um, I do think with how recent the pandemic and switching to virtual has been, there has been quite a bit of catch up and maybe retroactive sort of oh this is something that we need to think about this is something that we should be considering um what the other resource that i consulted was the chicago consortium for cultural accessibility and they also only had best practices listed in their um, resources section and they did not make any mention to um, laws or, or statutes or anything so I did look in the Montana code annotated. Um, I don't go in there very often. So I think my understanding of it is also a little bit limited, but it was very broad language and it was sort of related mostly to like building physical things and sort of, as you know, I think they were trying to be as broad as possible and not put too many restrictions in place. So, um, I think if we want to look more specifically at laws, I would feel more comfortable consulting with a lawyer um, as opposed to having me <laughs> research that and make the call. Um, but I do think that this language is pretty standard for just general accessibility in events that I've seen, whether they were virtual or in person. Um, so I think when when I was looking into this, I was trying to keep it as broad as possible so that hopefully this would be a conversation I would have with people who are reaching out to me. And then hopefully we could find something that would fit. Um, so I'm happy to relook at this again, but um, Superintendent Kristen, in, in regards to your suggestion, I, I think in my non-lawyer background, that could work. <laughs> Um, but I don't know if we need to consult with somebody about that. Thank you. So I, ha I have some pause with this. When I do policies at our agency, because policies affect the people that I work with within the agency, as well as those that are our general public, I always pass all of our policies and procedures through legal. And I know I have an in-house, and I know you don't have an in-house or the library, we don't have an in-house, but we have agency legal services that um, they are expensive, but they are a lawyer that uh, we could probably use to go through these things. I, I am very concerned about removing ADA. I'm very concerned about removing state or local disability accessible guidelines. Those still exist. It seems that the new language does not even address anything that accessibility in my world in education would within all of what was struck out. So I would number one, have these things reviewed by legal before uh, they come and they are implemented or even part of the policies that we have. And maybe they have been, I don't know. The other thing that I would say is I think the existing language that was struck out is, is fine. I don't know what the new language does any different. Elsie, on the other hand, is there any question that the state library would not follow or not comply with all applicable laws? I mean, as a as a state agency, isn't it required to follow all applicable laws? 
Kenny, you're exactly right. But to have anything done in a policy that, that could be legally looked at in the mind of public, if there's any risk to the agency at all, if you have it written down that the library is making every effort to comply with federal and state and local disability assessment guidelines, that is a protection because if it's not stated, and that's what I asked, possibly this is somewhere else in your policy, in the policy that we're looking at. If it's not, I would suggest that we at least keep it until legal reviews these things. May I say something? Um, I, I want to thank Superintendent for bringing up this point. Um, our, I see my role here as protecting librarians and protecting our patrons. And we're asking them to try to make this virtual program accessible, et cetera. I think in their protection, we need to have that statement in there that we would um, follow all laws to the ADA without it just saying best practices. I It didn't jump out at me before. I appreciate you saying that it will. I don't mean to sound negative, but I know this will go in the direction of certain parents saying, my child has this disorder and it is common practice for you to provide this program and this whole, and now we're trying to meet all these needs that legally, it, we kind of push that on the libraries if we don't say what the standard ADA. I know you're in hope in a lot of the school districts were in a bind with, um, with the languages, with the language barriers. We have one great school in Bolton that has 27 languages. And all of a sudden that was a big issue on the virtual. Just do you have, how do you provide languages in 24 different, the children speak in 24 different languages in one class, you know, one grade school. So um, I, I would support just leaving as we have it. I think it's really important the way it's written, but. Um, I like leaving in there um, all applicable laws, including standards and practice of ADA and best practices, but not limited to. I, I just think we're covering our staff. I do also want to thank you, Commissioner Cam. I do want to clarify that um, we that we would not be expecting the libraries to host these programs themselves. Um, all of these programs will be going through the state library as. Yes this programming series is happening. So um, libraries, of course, are welcome to co-host, but I envision me and other state library staff helping to organize that portion. So I, I don't want libraries to misunderstand that they would be expected to do these things. I think that would be something that the state library would be taking on. Thank you. Could, so well, go ahead. Go ahead, Kristen. Well, if I could add one thing, Elsie, Elsie thank you. Um, I don't see why we couldn't combine both. Leave the leave the old and add the new because your new does address the virtual programs. Um, sure. And maybe we could have uh, attorneys review both of those phrases to keep both in there. I I was, I, was thinking, so, I was thinking with a, a futuristic view as we are going forward with more virtual learning, more virtual, that there probably will be laws that yeah, will be more regulation, right? And maybe that would cover it, you yeah. know, and then we wouldn't have to be addressing this in the future. We wouldn't leave ourselves open. And everything bubbles from the bottom up. So even though it's the library here, I agree. But the libraries and the ground floor in Browning are the ones who are going to be saying, um, but we have this need and on the digital way. Best practice could be that you make it available with da da da, you know. So it, I like keeping both of them. I think futuristic is the word. Unfortunately, there's going to be more laws and not to. So, Jenny, if we struck the strike through, um, would it have to go back to the NAC? Um, does somebody, do we, do we do this as a friendly amendment? So 
if you want to make a motion to uh, add that like the back the paragraph. So I have one question. I'll come back to this. Has legal reviewed this? Any legal? Policy we did not have agency legal services review the policy. Is that not part of procedure to do that, Jenny? Uh, it depends on the the policy or, or uh, question at hand. Uh, it's not typically part of our policy uh, when we don't necessarily have the resources to do that. So the question is then the impact. Let's go back to the purpose of this policy because maybe it doesn't need to be vetted through legal. The purpose of this policy is for what then? How will it guide? Who will it guide? Amelia, you want to come back up? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Miss Chu Chu Tzu. Yeah, she can speak here. They can hear. Okay. Um, so this was sort of a, I mean, it's a policy, obviously, but it's also a guiding document um, for us as librarians to kind of put down what we're hoping for this programming series to do, um, for the public to understand what this programming series is hoping to do. Um, and then we did also include a section on if anyone in the public had issues with our programming. Um, so there's a, uh, a process for submitting a concern or submitting a complaint um, so that we would just have something in place um, since we were working with the public directly. Um, so sort of, I, I did sort of base this off of um, other library policies like collection development policies and um, public space use policies that libraries have just so that people have a clear understanding of what this programming series is and what we're hoping to do and how they can bring up any concerns that they have. Thank you. So coming to it, is there any risk to the state library or any risk to a public library that they will not be able to conform or work within this policy? Is it going to put more burden onto them or is it less burden onto us? In other words, what is the ramification if this policy um, goes through? Is it risk to the Montana State Library? Superintendent, I believe this policy actually reduces the risk for libraries. Libraries are already offering virtual programming and we are beginning to support more virtual programming. So we need a policy in place that guides uh, how and provides information to the public, as Amelia said, for how programs are selected and gives citizens a chance to uh, register concerns if they have concerns about the type of virtual programming that's offered. So having a policy in place that provides that information and that clarifying guidance for us and for libraries reduces our risk. Uh, and in particular, with regard to the accessibility statement, um, again, as uh, Commissioner Hall pointed out, it does say that accessibility concerns will be addressed to the extent that resources allow, understanding that there are, are costs involved in uh, trying to provide accessible opportunities to the um, to the maximum level, such as affording having uh, someone be able to provide sign language services. So I believe that this policy uh, is something that could be readily, certainly readily adopted by the state library, which is, as Amelia said, part of the intent, and, but also then mitigates that risk for other libraries. I just want to say I don't have any concerns with uh, Kenning's suggestion and, and Kristen's suggestion to leave the language that was suggested to be struck and carrying forward. And we can certainly have staff report back on uh, any additional research that might reveal flaws that we're not made aware of at this time. Suggestion, Kenning. I would so are you take the move if I knew exactly how you were. <laughs> are you suggesting that we that we make this change and vote on it? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> well, we need some of it. That would be an amendment to the motion. <clears throat> Sorry, that would be be an amendment to the motion that we would need to vote on that amendment first. 
I would amend the motion to include the structure. Well, there's not a motion yet. I, I think it was. No, there was. Wasn't there? There was. Hadn't been moved. Okay. Okay. So we we can add this to it, or just somebody take it away? needs to make a motion that we um, uh, adopt. adopt this resolution with this policy, and and then we'll we make need a, to defeat amendment. the one on the on the table. And no, I don't think we need to defeat it. I think we just need to. Well, you got to. You either amend it as it is. Well, there isn't a motion on it, and nobody's made a motion yet. I thought somebody did. No. Okay. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Then I would make a motion that we approve the statement from the NAC only add, leave in the stricken part. Can I second that? Motion that, that, that we adopt the, the policy. And then, and then we'll make a, an amendment to the motion. To add that. Yes. I make a move. I move to accept the policy. I have a second. Thank you. Now, I, do we have to vote on it first or do we have to, we have to amend it first? Amend it. Amend it. Okay, so now. Amend it. I move to amend the motion by adding back the stricken paragraph. Yes. Second, please. So then, um, Robin and Dalton need to accept the friendly amendment. Okay. I accept the friendly amendment. I'll second. For amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Got right. it. Any further discussion? Any public comment? Okay, then all those commissioners in favor of uh, approving the policy with the amendment to uh, include the, the language that was formerly stricken, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for navigating through that. If I can add, I would appreciate that we do have legal look at policies before they interact with us as a commission, so we can be backed up with any opportunities. I would hate to put staff in a legal position myself. I'm a fifth grade teacher. I would not want to be part of that either. I do know that late uh, legal services can be contracted. It is an expense, but I believe it also bonifies our work moving forward. I think this is why Jenny was uh, pushing for uh, legal staff, legal uh, counsel on staff. And I believe that attempt was not supported by state. But we do have access. We do have access. We have access to a commissioner's or yeah. Fact, we can ask for. How does that work practically? Uh, Sorry, right. um, we do have a, a signed agreement with Agency Legal Services, which is a department under the Department of Justice. And so, if there's a request for a legal opinion uh, through me, probably the commission would make that request for an, an attorney's opinion, and I would then bring to you. It varies greatly. Right now, the attorney that we're working with um, is not licensed to practice law in Montana yet, so he's having to be supervised. Provided. Okay. All right. Does anybody else support else? I mean, obviously, else we can't check every policy, but there must be any policies that might seem to have three. Repercussions for our librarians and our patrons. Should we just be conscious of that? I think we should always expect that we will be governed by federal law. ADA Title One through Five covers state and local government. Uh, the policy that we're putting in place will never take that away. So all I'm all I'm asking from myself, who leads the second largest agency, we deal with a, a tremendous amount of 
people uh, across our state, as well as with youth, that even though you don't want to be in a litigious environment, constant, you do not want that. But a review of our policies going forward, I believe is best practices for an agency. And the environment that we are in um, is, is tricky. I just wanna make sure that we as a library commission understand that we want the agents to be at less risk and what we say, how we say things, um, especially if they interact with the, the public should have a legal review before it comes to the, the board. That would be a budgetary item that might need to be put in there. I am not for a legal person to be on staff. I think the agency is small enough, but agency legal services through DOJ is available for these kind of reviews. And I believe the investment in that will help protect the agency, the library, the state library moving forward. Yeah, and I, and I don't think anybody's in disagreement with that, Elsie. And I think El, uh, Jenny earlier said that she makes a judgment as to which uh, policies she sends to um, legal services for review. Um, and in this case, just made a judgment that this one didn't need to go to legal review. So it's always a, a balance between cost and, uh, and timeline. How, how long this will, uh, how much time this will add to each policy for you. I do not want to take it away from the state librarian and her authority, but as a commission, I believe if we're going to vote and our names are on the voting of this, that the policy be thoroughly vetted and it should be something that we put into our normal sense of practice. I think it protects us. What I hear, if I'm wrong, is just Elsie saying, Jenny, be a little more cautious about the legal ramifications. Anybody can sue anybody at any time. And just, I know librarians by nature are just seem to be very good hearted people who don't think anybody's going to come after them when they're offering Christopher. You know, um, Winnie the Pooh books, but be cautious because I would have been being, being cautious. Okay, let's move on to the uh, freedom to read statement. This is also an action item. You saw this statement at our last meeting and we agreed to send it back to the NAC for some further revision. Um, you have both the uh, final uh, version that's looking for approval and the marked up version for reference in your agendas. You want to speak to this? Sure, I'm happy to. And, and I will make the point that we did have uh, agency legal services review this document, so it has gone through that legal day. Uh, when the commission considered this freedom to read statement as a draft from the NAC at your June meeting, uh, there was a couple of pieces of discussion that the commission wanted the NAC to further consider. Uh, there was a question about whether or not the language that says libraries have procedures in place for reevaluating the selections if library users voice concern. There was a, a suggestion initially that that language be removed and commissioners requested that it, it remain. And so upon consideration from the Network Advisory Council, the council concurred with the commission. And so that language was retained uh, in the statement. Um, there was also a request from the commission to amend some language to say to submit to anything less is contrary to the freedoms afforded through access to information to read to allow anything less is contrary to the rights afforded to Montanans and Americans uh, and the, the council also concurred with the commission so that language was amended. There are just some other minor modifications that don't change the intent of the statement that you can see in the marked up version largely to change the readability of the document, and then to acknowledge that library selections include more than just books. So it was brought in to say library materials. Again, the, the changes there don't change the intent of the statement. 
I want to be clear about what this statement is. It, as we talked about in June, it's a statement in principle. It's not a governing policy. It's not a policy for the state library. It's not a policy for any other libraries. It acknowledges the importance of local control in determining what local collection development policies look like. It acknowledges the important role that library professionals play in building their collections, following their professional standards and expertise. It allows for people to question items that are in their local collections. Uh, and importantly, the statement says that uh, every reader has a right to read what they want to read uh, without other people infringing on that right. Kenny, I shared last night with Jenny, so uh, because I don't believe in surprises at meetings like this, I do have some concerns with this as a parent. Um, I think this is a great policy for adults. I have no problem with this for adults. I agree with every part of it. And I appreciate NAC, is that what we call them, for putting this back in, um, that statement that people have a right. But I have a little problem where it said no one has a right to tell um, anyone what to read. Well, parents do for their children. And county attorneys and sheriffs and even county commissioners do, but if it's legal, and we talked about this last night, um, obviously the libraries are not ordering pedophilia material or how to pick up children. Um, but there was a case in our hometown where some very ill person was going into the library and putting the children's section computers on child porn. So when the parents came in with their kids, that was the first thing that did so. Um, and we like to think that kind of thing doesn't happen. But again, parents do have a right to say what their children are gonna read. Um, sheriffs and county attorneys have a right to say, this is illegal material, it will not show to our children. Now, I know we talked about having a statement that said that we would have legal guidelines and age appropriate. And as Jenny pointed out, age appropriate is very subjective. And I would agree with that. Um, but to be honest with you, libraries are very subjective. What you think is a wonderful book, I may not. My top 10 library books or books of all time probably are not the same as your top 10. I think probably some are shared, um, but it is a subjective. But I really want somewhere in here that we make it clear this is aimed at adults. And as it's written, aimed at adults is beautiful. So uh, Jenny did say that this has been through legal services. Mm -hmm. and they did not raise that in this one. They did not, Kenny. Thoughts from other commissioners? I I have a thought <clears throat> and a question. I was Googling this and apparently there was a freedom to read uh, statement back in 1955, the very first original one, uh, I guess in response to banning of books. And somewhere I found that on our Montana State Library website. So I think I just searched it. I can't tell you where it is, but it took me to it. So I printed that out and read through that thoroughly last night to see how this statement compares with that statement. Um, and I guess my question is, the intent behind this, is it to supersede that 1955 statement? Is it to piggyback upon it? Um, I, I guess I'm why? not not that I have disagreement with the the value of the statement, but why are we writing it um, when when there is the original one. Do we have the 1955 one? Not any. So the, the 1955 one uh, was based on or, or adopted from the American Library Association Freedom to Read Statement. 
uh, and uh, there have been some points of diversion with uh, libraries thinking with the American Library Association, um, not necessarily wholly in, in this regard, um, but we feel in the Network Advisory Council feels like it's important for the State Library and State Library Commission to have an independent statement. So Tammy, with with regard to what you said about children, I, you know, this this statement comes from originates from the rights that are enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, right? And I think that is that document is generally understood to apply to adults. I'm not sure what specifically it says about children, but it. That's a very big question is this is from those rights and I agree with Thomas Jefferson and I agree with the rights, but they're in the adults and um, I, I just feel that parents did not be ignored in this issue and I, if we were going, I, like I said, I would rather just say a statement on a freedom to read for adults and then if we decide at some point to do one for children, or page whatever we have to really develop that that I that's going to be a hard one, you know, because it is very subjective. But I just feel strongly that parents have a right to. Uh, kids do come to libraries by themselves today, and they will challenge accessibility to everything. And um, I think we were fairly good Catholic kids when we were growing up, but when we went to the public library, everybody went for the National Geographic. <laughs> and you, some of you don't understand that because you're young, but that was where we, you know, learned about things. Um, and I just think parents need to be aware and or are, and they're getting, we don't want parents to think we're not working with them. I want parents to know that we care about the kids. I want parents to know that we love the kids. And we're, we, I just want kids to know the joy of the library and no fear of it. And parents to know that this is a wonderful place to bring your children. Right, but the reason why I said that was, I don't think, I'm not reading anything into this that negates the rights of parents. I thought you had a statement that no one has a right to tell them no one person has the authority to determine what library provided resources are appropriate for someone else. Yes. Right. I'll so I don't, I don't think that that's, I don't think that that um, negates rights of parents. Parents might have a right to say, this set of books needs, to, I need to give approval. But shouldn't the parents have that conversation with the child? Of yes, they should. The libraries. But unfortunately, a lot of kids today don't have the parents. Well, I think a lot of kids these days have cell phones. Yeah. And our statement here can't supersede what somebody's carrying around. That's a really good point. I'm sorry, Dalton. I didn't hear what you just said. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, Kristen, I have said that there's a lot of kids with cell phones in their pockets these days, and our statement today cannot have control over that. And then my former remark was parents should be having conversations with their children about what materials are appropriate. Thank you. Yes, agreed. Elsie, I was recommending that we have this statement on the freedom to read for adults so that we just don't open that up to children. But What's the definition of an adult in Montana? I think 18. I think legally 18. In the 1955 edition, it does address young people. In different sections of law, um, youth is described 
differently. I know in my world, in Title 20, uh, in Montana annotated, that um, you know, the definition might be might be different. Um, I concur that if we want to put this on as adults, that definition would be uh, probably more palatable to me. Uh, in my world, where I deal with individuals, um, basically we keep data from birth on, uh, but they come into public education uh, at the age of three with disabilities. So if this would like to have uh, just the title of it for adults, I think that would be um, a better manner to go. And then again, I don't know what this is going to be used for. What, what would we be using this, um, this for? What is this purpose? What's the purpose? Where will we show it? How will it be used? What is the implementation of this? Why? I, I think it's a it's a statement of support um, and, and a very uh, real and current example of why it's needed is the, is the report that Tracy gave us this morning. Could we get a copy of the 1955 one and see why we're changing it? Maybe that could be printed up before we, we get to put this. Because obviously there's already one in here. And so there has to be a reason. Um, I know 1955 doesn't seem long ago to some of you, but that's very long ago. And I believe the latest update on that was 1991, but I may be wrong on that date, but there was an updated update to that. Robin, it looks like it was um, possibly Oh, well, the, it was this was at, this the one I have on the Montana.gov. It says adopted in June 25th of 53 by the ALL, ALA Council and the AAP Freedom to Read Committee, amended January 28th, 1972, January 16th, 1991, and July 12th, 2000, and June 30th, 2004. So I believe there were amendments. Through it would help me to see that. I would need to know why we're changing what we have because there is something in place. It I is, assume it this was all in there. It is extremely long. And, and, and as I said, um, the, this freedom to read statement is not the statement from the State Library Commission. It's a statement from the American Library Association that was supported by the State Library and the State Library Commission. Um, Again, there have been questions called against the American Library Association and some of the advice and guidance that libraries receive from them. And so libraries are looking to the State Library Commission for that kind of support. And that's what this statement is intended to do. It's intended to be an independent statement from the State Library Commission about these matters, not something reliant on the American Library Association, which is what this document is. And Jenny, could I just also have clarification? And I think I heard you from the last meeting and the June meeting that this was written by whom? The Freedom to Read statement was uh, that you're considering was adapted from other uh, Freedom to Read statements, in particular, the American Association of Rural and Small Libraries, uh, and then further reviewed by the Network Advisory Council and our agency legal services. Okay, but did staff write this or did our liaison to NEC or who 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 wrote this actual draft? Staff wrote it, I wrote it. You wrote this, okay. And I guess that's my main concern. It didn't originate the commission. So it's, you know, everything in this draft, it says Mon the MSL commission, the commission. And when it didn't originate from the commission, that's where I have concern um, about, again, our involvement in this. Because it has our name on it. Yeah, we, we're being asked to approve it. It's very little that comes to us that originates from the commission. Right. And uh, just- But we're to, approving it. We are being asked to approve, approve it, yes. It. But just as we are other policies and right. statements. I agree. And there's nothing unusual about this. 
But there's nothing unusual about amending it like we did the other one. Right. I will say, uh, going back to our, my earlier question, the legal age to marry in Montana is 16. So are we going to try to restrict what a 16-year-old married person can read? The age to vote is 18. Yes. Age to drink or Age to hunt. Well, our but the other <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it gets us into I a know. very uh, a morass. And, and again, but I, think I would suggest know what that if mean. legal it's services has looked at this and, and not had any issue with it. Yeah. I, I think it's self understood when we say Montana State Library Commission statement on freedom to read for adults means we're not saying this for children. How do they word it now? You said they refer to different ages. It's the freedom to read statement. No, but I mean, in the, how oh, they do it for the ages. Um, so this talks about that. Uh, it reads There is no place in our society for efforts to coerce the taste of others to confine adults to the reading matter deemed suitable for adolescents or to inhibit the efforts of writers to achieve artistic expression. Then goes on, talks about. The, to to some much of the much of modern expression is shocking, but it's not much of life. It's self shocking. We cut off literature as a source and we prevent writers from dealing with stuff of life. Parents and teachers have a responsibility to prepare the young to meet the diversity of experiences in life to which they will be exposed, as they have a responsibility to help them learn to think critically for themselves. These are affirmative responsibilities, not to be discharged simply by preventing them from reading works for which they are not yet prepared. In these matters, values different, and values cannot be legislated, nor can machinery be devised that will suit the demands of one group without looking at the freedoms of others. But it's so basically it's saying that kids can go ahead and read because like this, the genre shock. Um, it's yeah, and it was updated in 2004. No, four, four. I just want to add, uh, my opinion is that where it says we recognize that not every book is right for every reader that to me encompasses the children and not every book is appropriate for children but again i believe that it goes back to a parent's duty to mitigate that and coming from an education background and being the teacher i knew that i couldn't teach every kid what they needed that the parent had to be involved so I, I have to leave it in the parents' ballpark then for children under 18 to make those decisions for their children. Um, and the hill that I was going to die on was the next phrase that the libraries have procedures in place for reevaluating those resources. And I'm glad to see that was left in. I agree, Kristen. I was going to say the same thing. If you look at the first, the second paragraph, we maintain and operate the state library and give assistance and advice. That's our one of our goals. And then, but we have that full paragraph about what to do if it is not a book that someone wants to. I mean, there is our procedures in place, but everybody has the right to question it, but we also have the right to follow the procedures and put it in the library. So. I'm happy with this draft. Okay. How about you, Elsie? Are you feeling better about this draft now that that comment's back in? That we recognize that every book is a that isn't right for every reader, and and that you can challenge books if you're a parent. Thank you, Tammy. What I believe is that this is twofold. Um, you know, I come back to purpose always. Um, I believe the libraries, and this comes, this is in the very original 
when we had the first presentation about the challenges in our library systems, just in government as it is, uh, possibly not believing or not understanding pathways, uh, authority or other things. So I believe the libraries across our state are looking to us to lead in trying to mitigate. Um, but I firmly believe in local control. So I don't wanna to be too top heavy within that third paragraph, but I do wanna be responsive to the library professionals. And so I think it's taken care of with parents to a degree, but I still come back to purpose. You know, the library commission is uh, leading in a statement multifold here. And I think we need to make sure that we're doing it um, carefully in support of our libraries and our professionals, but must also be support of parents wherever and whoever they are. So I don't know if it's strong enough about uh, the word objectional or strong enough about a collection development policy. Uh, I don't know if it's professional standards that are strong enough to be able to mitigate the challenges that we've witnessed through what happened through the imaginative challenges uh, most recent this spring and fall. So I question the language in the third paragraph. Is it strong enough? Should it be there? It also has the line, reflect and support the communities they serve. I think that gives some local control. Mm -hmm. Kenny, when this first came up, someone made a reference to Kalispell, that this was a response kind of designed and where somebody saw the need of this. And I wasn't on the committee then. I did go back and read the controversy back then. Um, I guess one thing I would always it, uh, if I learned anything in 10 years on a school board, it's that you don't write policy around one situation. It's a really bad idea. Right. Um, and, and that's why, and I was guilty of it too. When I started on the school board in 1980, our policy book was like that. 10 years later, we had four books and they were like this. Because, I mean, this is not a policy. Right. Every situation, somebody would say, oh, we have to write something about that. Well, no, not if it's an exception. It's an exception that we're dealing with as heart driven, as intelligent, and as legally as we can. Um, but this is this is not a policy. Not this a policy. is just the state of support. Right. And and if I could reiterate the concerns that Tracy addressed earlier this morning, again, libraries are looking to the state library and the state library commission to provide that leadership and that support. And they want the commission to adopt this policy. This was reviewed, thoroughly vetted by our network advisory council. Um, we had public comment at those advisory council meetings. Um, we have librarians here. There's some public comment if we get to it so that you can hear from librarians, their views on this statement to address some of the superintendent's questions. But librarians are answerable often to a library board appointed by the county commissioners um, or city commissioners, I guess it does depend on the county. City or county. Yes, I would say or county. So what I wouldn't want to accidentally back into something that was approved strongly by the librarians, but the city and the councils in the county feel like we didn't get their input when they're the ones who are responsible. The so again, this is this isn't a policy, and this statement specifically refers to collection development policies, which are those policies that are adopted at the local library level by those local library boards. Nothing in the statement supersedes anything in those collection development policies. The statement reinforces the need for having those good collection development policies in place okay. that allow for collections to be built and also allow for people to then question that. So the statement reinforces the need for that kind of local discussion about those collection development policies that is, as Peggy pointed out, reflecting the needs of the community. 
And I noticed you said collections, and I had circled that. Are you saying collections as opposed to a book on a subject, but for a whole collection of books on the subject? Are you deliberately aiming at collections? This, this statement is about the, the collections that libraries build to provide a variety of access to their community, be it books, be it ebooks, okay. be it online databases. Uh, I, I would point out that with regard to online public access computers and what might be accessible through those computers, this, this statement really would apply to that because that's not something that a library builds as part of the collection. Okay, so may I ask for a motion to approve this statement? You know, Kenny, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be blunt here. I don't think I'm ready to vote yet. I think there's a little bit more that I need to to recognize in my world and see exactly what this has an opportunity um, to move forward. And Jenny, I guess I need your leadership to share, you know, we want to support the library professionals. That's where that's where I'm coming from. That's what the state library and in our role as commission should be able to do. But I'm looking at this and it's almost in a in a the tone I don't believe is in a positive uh in a in a pot it's still more of an us versus them. I don't necessarily see it in a positive light in leadership from the state library. So the words are here I just don't know if it is in a shape yet that I am willing to put my name on this. And my name as state superintendent has a lot of weight in our school libraries. So I hope you understand why I'm a little resident at this point, because I have a K-12 system where I have very young children and I have very young adults. So I am asking that we look at this one more time possibly side by side. And Jenny, again, is there a purpose and a reason why at this time we must vote today? Superintendent, this is the second meeting we brought this statement forward. Um, the Network Advisory Council worked to consider the recommendations from the commission and concurred with those recommendations. Um, so I think it's unfortunate that uh, the, the, these kinds of reservations continue to be voiced uh, since we have had a chance for the NAC to review this now twice and the commission to review it twice. So help me understand this. Then the draft that I'm seeing on the screen right now has been changed since our last visit, correct? It has. So I would like a little bit more time to review this second draft before I put my vote on it. Now I'm not the quorum of the of the commission by any means. I just would like a little bit of understanding from my world of where I have school libraries, where we do a tremendous amount of work within building literacy, making sure that we have parents, that we have school administrators, school leaders. In my world, it might be a little bit different. And that's why I'm asking for a little bit more pause. I do not understand the hurry. And Kelsey, I would add um, that, you know, we have spent two meetings now. We've had lengthy discussions about this uh, in both meetings. And these materials have been available to us for more than a week um, to, to review. So I'd like to move ahead with a motion. If, if we decide not to pass this, then we can revisit it. So I'll restate your motion again. <clears throat> yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to approve the freedom to read statement. Thank you. I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, any further? I have one public comment discussion. online. Okay. Okay. Um, you want to start with that one? I just want to see okay. if there's any further discussion among the commissioners. I would like time to talk to county commissioners and city commissioners and just see their reaction. They probably are fine with it, but I sure would like to hear their input. Public comment? I have one from um, Denise R. North Valley Public Library. Are you, um, are you sure? Uh, if she's asking for accepting public comment, if so, I would like to say that as a librarian reading the news, I would like the commission to make a statement that protects us. 
parents have a right to choose what their children read, but if they send their children to the library alone and a child brings a book to check out, we are not able to know or evaluate if that book is appropriate for that child. I agree it's the parent's job to have conversations with children about what is appropriate and librarians cannot be put in a position to monitor or censor what patrons read. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hi, Kenning, if I may chime in. Again, this is Jody Moore, and I'm the library director at the Red Lodge Carnegie Library and the current chair of the NAC. And I, I do want to echo um, what Jenny was saying. Um, the NAC took this statement very seriously. We did make changes um, since the last version, but those changes were at the behest of this group. And it does feel rather demoralizing to think that twice now we've made efforts to improve this statement and, and it's just going to be pushed off to the side again. So I would encourage everybody to um, consider uh, voting on this motion today. Um, and then specifically to Superintendent Artson, I appreciate your concerns and I appreciate your role representing school libraries is, is a slightly different um, perspective, but this statement to me a couple of times does reference specifically public libraries. I don't believe this is a statement that is being aimed towards school libraries or school librarians, um, nor does it tell us individually at our libraries what our policies look like in terms of how we actually circulate materials to the public. This is a statement that I believe is there for Montanans, um, letting them know that we um, respect and um, recognize their rights as readers, um, it also recognizes their rights to share complaints if they do have those. Um, however, for those of us um, in the libraries, working in the libraries and working with our local boards, it does feel like it acknowledges um, our professional standards and um, supports us should an issue arise. So I want you to know that the NAC really did think about who is this statement for, um, who does this statement represent? How are we protecting um, all interests in this? We did take that very seriously. Um, and then I'm sorry, I don't know the, I can't recognize the folks who aren't online who's talking, but the concerns related to parents, the role of parents, um, I do see this. I think the NAC sees this as like a guiding document similar to, um, you know, um, a constitutional document. It's speaking to adults. Um, it's speaking to, you know, Americans, yes, include children, but they're not um, voting citizens in the same way that adults are. I think it's clear that it's speaking to adults. We did at one point in time have a sentence about um, parents and it, it ended up upon read through it, it looks like it would be confusing. Um, and sort of muddy the waters. So I do just want you all to know how, how carefully and seriously um, the NAC took this document, each sentence, we did think about it carefully. It doesn't mean we didn't miss anything. It doesn't mean you shouldn't question what we've come up with, but it was done with good intent and I would appreciate you considering it today. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. I came in here today um, kind of very open-minded about this because you did, NAC did accept my request that they put that comment back in about this being objectionable. And I appreciate the comment that you just read from the staff member, but that comment you just read from that staff member absolutely cemented for me that I cannot vote for this because she was saying she needs this so she can say, I cannot tell a child what book they can take out of the library. I'm 73 years old and maybe I am just out of date, but if a six-year-old kid, their parents drop them off at the library trusting us, and they go over and get a graphic book on sex out of an adult side and go over and they want to take that book. I can't believe there isn't a librarian that would say, this book was taken from that section you need to get a book from this section. I am appalled that that lady would look at this or anybody and say, well, that gives me an opportunity to say, 
it's inappropriate for me to tell anybody, a child or anybody, I would hope a librarian and the librarians I know, just like the teachers I know, would never put a kid at risk by putting that in their hands. And I don't want a piece of stuff here that is aimed at saying, as adults, come on, let's grow up. Let's let people read what they want to read, be what they want to be. Let's let's just be kind to be taken as, well, kids, here you go, kids. Well, it, Tammy, um, I think that's a rather extreme example. And I and I don't think I'd be surprised if any librarian were were to do that. I think there, there's a, a more nuanced example of a librarian getting between a 17 or 18 year old. I don't think that was person. the question. When she said and it, there, she said a parents. child. She did not say a young adult. She said a child. I do not want to be in a role where I am between a child and a book. I think that's a rather fair. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Yeah. Are open to public comments. Yes. I believe the discussion amongst the commission. Yes. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Sorry, I am Rachel Ron. I'm the director of the Haver Hill County Library. I work at the circulation desk a lot, probably 12 to 10, 20 hours a week. And I do check out a lot of books to children. And we cannot control what kids, we can't say the kids can't check out a book. We can say, hey, are you sure this is what you want to read? Maybe you want to rethink it. But we don't say you're not allowed to check this out. And implying in any way that we have that responsibility is just opening us up to liability. Yes. Thank you. Hello, I am Rebecca Camp and I work for the Montana State Library, but I like to speak in my personal role as a mother. Um, I'm a mother of three kids and I agree fully with what Dalton said. I don't want another adult or parent to say what's okay for my kids to read. As a parent, I like to be active in those decisions. And sometimes that decision is to drop my kid off at the library. And in that situation, I'm saying it's okay for them to check out what they choose. And if I feel differently, then it's my job to be there to oversee it. It's not the job of the library to make a judgment on in that case. Uh, my name is Kyla McGregor. I currently work for the state library. I previously worked at uh, a public library doing the surf decks and uh, collection development. I do not have children, um, but growing up, a big part of my uh, childhood was going to the library with my father. And it was a huge part of me becoming a librarian to uh, help contribute to the safe spaces that libraries provide. But to me personally, part of that safe space is not having a staff member dictate to a patron, whether that's an adult or a child, um, what they're allowed to check out the library. Um, I can appreciate that it's a difficult position for staff to be in, um, but there, there are so many examples. There are just as many examples of parents who are comfortable with children picking out DVDs or books that they're going to read together or audiobooks they're going to take on a trip. And I do not claim to know what a parent is comfortable having their child uh, check out. And so I am not going to stand between that child and their parent or guardian having a conversation. I feel that this document as is would support me as a staff member. Um, and if you have any questions about other public comment, for example, Denise's that was mentioned in chat, um, what, of how she stands on, on the wording, I, I would probably just ask for clarification because I read her comment differently than yeah. some of the commissioners may have. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay, I'd like to call the motion, call question on the motion. Um, all those commissioners in favor of the motion, please say state aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. No. No. <laughs> Any abstentions? Thank you. The motion carries. 
I'd like to suggest we take a 10 minute break. We've been at it almost two hours. So we'll be back here at 11.30. Recording has resumed. Okay, we are back in session. Um, okay, uh, so we have another action item. Uh, this is the rebrand subcommittee uh, recommendation. And who's taking this one? Kristen, are you there? I'm here, and I believe, Jenny, <clears throat> were you going to speak, um, talk about the history of the the digital yeah, te yeah. technology first? Let's, let's have, if it's okay, Kenny, um, if she can speak first, and then I'll piggyback off of that. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. I shared with the subcommittee that's been looking at the branding, uh, a little history and kind of a story about the State Library's digital evolution that I think would be helpful for the rest of the commission to hear because I, I think it could help inform some of the subcommittees thinking about the nature of the rebranding. Um, and I want to I want to thank Tammy. Tammy had said when we did her orientation with her that she would appreciate more of a history of the State Library, and I recognize that that was something that was lacking in some of the orientation that we've done with commissioners. So uh, if you'll allow me, I wanted to try to take you through some of the evolution of our services that led us here today. Um, the, the State Library um, in its earliest form did have a physical print collection. Uh, in many ways, the State Library was intended to be a library resource, especially for small communities where their patrons might not have access to the typical kinds of materials you might see in a library. So the State Library's collection included fiction and nonfiction and poetry and other kinds of, of resources, uh, resources that we certainly don't have today. Uh, in the mid, early 1980s, 1983, and then in 1985, the Montana State Legislature passed legislation that created the Natural Resource Information System and the Natural Heritage Program. And in 1985, that program was moved to Montana State Library because the legislature recognized that the kinds of information that was being collected about Montana's natural resources should be made available to all in the natural home for that would then be in a library and thus the state library. And so I've always been just incredibly honored and proud of the state library's recognition and service in providing that kind of resource to Montana. We are the only state library in the country that provides that kind of information. Uh, and in fact, other states have suggested that they would love to see their state libraries house their natural heritage program, for example. That program has always been digital. It has never been printed. We have worked to collect digital data and make it available from its inception. And just as an example, that program was a, a very, very early adopter of geographic information systems to help manage that natural resource data because so much of it is place-based. And to articulate how early a leader the Montana State Library was in adopting GIS technology, uh, we licensed software from a company called Esri. They're the premier software vendor for GIS services. They're a, a multi-billion dollar international company. And they give their customers customer numbers based on the order in which those customers acquire their licenses. And this is customer number is 186 out of hundreds of thousands of customers. We have been a leader in this space and we continue to be a leader in this space. In 1997, the water information system statutes were created that created the water information system. Again, a, a wholly digital from its inception program. In about 2001, the state library went through a strategic planning process. And in, in that review, they acknowledged that that print collection that they were managing was not being used and it really no longer had a relevant need to serve state library patrons. And so 
the state library divested itself of that print collection with the exception of state government information, uh, some federal government documents and uh, documents pertaining to the natural resource information system. In 2002, the Montana State Library and other partners like the Historical Society formed the Montana Memory Project as a platform for providing uh, online resources to Montana's cultural heritage. Again, something wholly with the intent of providing online digital access to those kinds of resources. In 2013, the state legislature passed legislation that moved the GIS program that was under the State Department of Administration, known as the Base Map Service Center, to the State Library, again, in recognition that that program was providing access to digital GIS information and that the appropriate home within state government was the Montana State Library. In 2017, the State Library experienced devastating budget cuts. Our, cut, our budget was cut for these services by about 30%. And the statements that were made at that time were that our budget was being cut because our services were non-essential, libraries were non-essential. But then even that the state library was non-essential, it was that libraries were non-essential. And the perception at the time was that libraries were all about books and therefore non-essential. And Staff and the commission at the time gathered to create a plan for how we were going to absorb a 30% budget cut. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we put on the table was simply turning off the cadastral application, which at the time was the fourth most used web application in all of state government. We proposed that idea because we knew it would make a statement about how truly essential our services were and that people didn't recognize when we talked about the inessential nature of our services, that they were actually talking about things like the cadastral application. The what? The cadastral application. And uh, our commissioners said no, they directed us to do no harm. And so we found other ways to uh, change our services. Uh, I failed to mention in about 2007, we changed our model for managing state government information. We made the decision to uh, move to a wholly digital state government information collection. And we began, began the process of scanning and digitizing our legacy collection of state government documents. And we began archiving state agency websites. Uh, in 2007, we also uh, worked with the state legislature to update the state government depository program legislation to allow for uh, a wholly digital state government information collection. And we partnered with the State Historical Society who now manages the print collection and we manage the, that digital collection. At the time we had proposed closing the reading room uh, at the state library, again, due to lack of use. We had five to six patrons who were coming in to use public access computers uh, and no one was checking out our print collections. Um, we would circulate maybe a couple hundred documents a year, uh, whereas the, the online version was being used hundreds of thousands of times a year. Um, this is, decision was made to keep the reading room open. Um, but when we faced those budget cuts in 2017, we, we knew one of the solutions had to be to close that reading room. It cost us about $200,000 a year to maintain. And uh, given the lack of use, it, it just made sense to close the reading room. In 2019, at the June meeting of the commission, we celebrated completing the process to wholly digitize our state government publications and the process to convert our talking book collection to a wholly digital collection. So we have been completely digital since 2019. We don't have a print collection. Uh, and we are very proud of our leadership in transforming the state library services to this digital model. It's not necessarily the same as what you see in public libraries. Public libraries, of course, still circulate books. But this rebranding is about the state library. 
Again, we don't have governing authority over other libraries. This rebranding is not intended to reflect library services in other libraries. The, the rebranding discussion is intended to reflect and acknowledge and draw attention to the work of the Montana State Library and to unify all of our work under a single brand to help our users understand when they are using services of the state library and to draw attention to the resources that we make available to users who might not know about the services of the state library. And we hope very sincerely to convey to everyone how truly essential the services of the state library are. I hope that little bit of background provides uh, some more context for discussion around uh, our view that our rebrand really needs to reflect the fact that we are, are not a library about books. Thank you. I just wanted to provide that background. Thank you, Jenny. Jenny, who are your patrons? That's a really good question. So we support uh, state agency employees. Uh, we work with federal agencies. We work with local governments. We work with nonprofits. We work with natural resource agencies. We work with the general public. We, for example, host the, the Montana COVID-19 dashboard, which was used about 20 million times last year. So we, we serve Montanans. So you don't see the public libraries as being part of your patronage. We provide consulting support and services to libraries. Because that's one of my conclusions in this, I think. And I'm new, and you guys are all much more experienced, but it seems to me that public libraries are, and the children and adults and people in the communities who go to the libraries are a big part of our patronage. I, I was at many of the motions we've had, the discussions we've had, and I owe an apology that, to that poor teacher that I, or librarian I snapped at. I, I'm allowing my experience as an abused child to come into the picture of not stopping people from protecting kids. Um, but I guess I came on here thinking that part of our, what we're here to help are libraries and, the, and staff. And I understand that you are over in charge of the, of the library but all these people and the people who call in and all this, it seems that they're very concerned about all these issues deal with local libraries. I know we don't have governorship over them, but it feels like there's a relationship there. There's certainly a relationship there. I, I think maybe your question is then, should it somehow this rebranding reflect who those libraries are? Yeah, that, that, that they're in the picture. I mean, I, I know what you're saying, and it was surprising when I said, who are your patrons? And I thought, and I'm very impressed with how much you guys do. I mean, you know, Evan, you could you could just list the image and all the things you do, it's just blowing you away. And I'm learning that. But, and now I understand why the big, this group, Hoff and York, spent six months just studying if they should keep the name library. They actually said in their report that they spent months deciding if libraries should stay in it, period. Because it's not really a library, but they kept it because the word library connotates positively with the majority of public. It means trust, depth of information, all these wonderful things. So we are keeping our image of library, but it's... It's just a conundrum. There was a time when libraries were filled with clay tablets and paper scrolls. I know. Right? I mean, they are just artifacts of information, the way books are. But and children so, are going back to books. It, for about five years ago, that Again, we're talking was, about the state library. Yeah, I know. Right? right, state library. But people, five years ago, they were saying children are 
not going to have books anymore. They're going to have their internet. They'll never pick up books. And now kids are saying, we like parents hold the book. We like books. Feel it. Touch they it, like to feel it, it. Touch it. Read it. Memorize it. Know it. Um, yeah, so I'm having a hard time why so many of these controversial things we're discussing are all based with libraries, and yet we're you're saying that we're not that's not our goal. I know Elsie, it's probably the same with you. Here you are part of this, but we're not part of the public libraries and the schools. And there's somebody here from the Board of Regents, but we're not part of the li university libraries, right? Right. Well, Tammy, thank you for that. Because we are uh, very rural in nature, a lot of the role that a public library um, at a, in a community level might have more of an interplay in our rural communities uh, as a school library would. Um, but we're all public taxpayer paid. In other words, the resources that we use are from our communities and from our taxpayers. So one of the things that I'd like to add, and I've just been doing a little bit of research on, you know, if we're moving forward, that it's not just about books, um, but that it's about other things that has been given in good faith to the library. Our state authority in 22-1-103 uh, may need to be amended. You know, even the authority of our commission is what I'm saying. I think our focus has to change as much as this logo changes, that there are many more individuals and programs at the table than just dividing um, between the state any kind of literary services. So if we're going to amend a logo, I think it's deeper than that. But I think it's incumbent, Jenny, then, to have a real review of what is the commission's work, um, what is uh, the authority that the commission has over all of these programs, and then build our library commission agendas to reflect all of the work that we have, not just focusing on the, the literary services that we do for our great public service to our public libraries. So are you saying the freedom to read that we have and the virtual programming and all that don't have anything to do with local library? That's only for the Montana, only for the 50 people who work in Helena at the state library. That's, no, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm very confused by that. They either are or they aren't involved with us. It's a relationship. It's a relationship, but this rebranding is about the state library and the services the state library offers. The rebranding is not intended to provide any kind of brand for local libraries. Yes. Beginning with your permission, may I move forward with the um, recommendation from the subcommittee? Please, Kristen, thank you. What is okay. she's about to tell us? Oh. So first of all, I need to thank Dalton. Uh, last night at 11 o'clock, he was helping me whittle this down and I was much more long-winded than I needed to be. So thank you. We brought this down to three concise bullet points that will hopefully help the commission in determining, um, determining their motion moving forward. The first bullet point is this. <clears throat> After correspondence between State Library and Jenny Staff and Department of Administration Director Giles, the Department of Administration asserted that the government rebranding effort will be driving uniformity in website format across the agencies, not logo consistency. The second bullet point is this, the subcommittee agreed that the proposed shape and prism concept will remain intact and has asked Hoffman York to provide two additional color palettes updating the prism rays, which can come from an array of natural colors found in nature across Montana. 
And the third bullet point is this. The subcommittee is recommending to the commission that Hoffman York will, at no additional cost, present two alternative logos to the subcommittee for review. In total, three separate color arrays will be available. If the alternative alternative logos are completed, the subcommittee intends to place the logo on the agenda for the October commission meeting and at the latest at the December commission meeting. Did we get those bullets? Um, I think right, I was early. Yeah, Kristen, if you email me that document, then I can, I'll add it to the meeting materials for this meeting and that way it can be accessed after. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll do that right now, Genevieve. Thank you. And just so people know, thank you, Kristen, for doing this. Kristen has COVID and she is very sick. And for her to even be up last night working on this and doing it today, we are extremely grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And I... I'm absolutely fine. It's just my voice is, is shot from um, a event over the weekend and unfortunately uh, picked that up someplace. I'm doing very well. The only reason I'm not there today is because uh, I did still test positive yesterday and I didn't want to be coughing and sharing all the goods with the entire commission. So thanks for letting me dial in via Zoom. Well, we appreciate that, Kristen. <laughs> so, Kristen, thank you for those um, those that recommendation, those three bullet items. Uh, my understanding is that we are uh, to vote on those recommendations today. Only if the commission feels it's necessary, or you can okay. just direct the the subcommittee to move forward as they proposed. Any comments? I would move that the subcommittee. Be directed to move forward with the three bullet points as explained by Kristen. I second. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Robin. Any further discussion? Any public comment? It, sorry. I am sorry, Ken, and I, I got real challenged in trying to get my unmute button off. But when it comes to the next step, and I think that's where we also need to look as a commission in putting this thing out there in a manner of utilizing the logo after it's done, whichever one it is. Um, and I know there will be cost associated with that. I don't know if this uh, company is going to be doing that, but I would like to know a little bit more. And if the subcommittee work could work toward that with Jenny to know exactly how and when this is going to be utilized in a rollout and the budget that's going to be um, attended to it, if we could uh, put that into the subcommittee or would that be something that would be brought to us at another time? Superintendent, we'd be happy to bring that information to the subcommittee. Um, Elsie, my, my thought on that is that we still, you know, I, I, everybody knows how I feel about this costing a third of a million dollars at this point in time is just, a little shocking, but um, we still have almost half of the money that has not been used and that would be available for the rollout. And according to what I've read and reviewed in the uh, contract, we are not obligated to go forth with that money being, being used. And so I would not like to go, I don't want to move forward with this with the assumption that we are approving the hundred whatever mil thousand left to be for the rollout. Um, that might be something that could be handled. There is a print shop internally within the government. There are graphic people there. There are other things within the government that could be used. And in a good faith effort to let the legislature know before they meet to fund us that we are being very sensible about budgeting. I would not want any the committee to go forward thinking we have approved that money. It, it, does that, is what I'm saying clear to you guys? I, that, that makes sense to me. Makes okay. sense to me. I very much appreciate it. I, I too am budget conscious. I just want to know what the next step of the rollout will be and want it to be understood that it would be a discussion with the commission uh, in moving forward. 
I want to remind everybody that this is not budget money. Okay? This is private funding, right. not taxpayer funding. This is funding that was voluntarily given to the Trust for Montana Libraries. Um, so it's not it's not a budget discussion, and it should not be um, a legislative concern. And I understand that. And who has say over how all the private money is spent? Sure. This commission, and just to clarify, it's the State Library Trust, not the Trust for Montana Library. Sorry, right. It's the State Montana Trust. Montana State Library Trust. So we we do have to have say over what how it's used. We do, and and the commission back in twenty twenty right. approved that recommendation, and so we we are currently under contract. We we there is requirements that we do work with state print and mail, uh, and we do work with them for certain things, uh, and we can have a discussion, as I said, with the the rebranding committee about everything that would be encompassed in the rollout um, certainly that may include some print materials but um, it, it's it's much more than just print materials that we would have produced with print mail and again that's information we can bring to the state okay thank Montana Trust, that how much is in it? The, the, the balance of the trust and any outstanding obligations are shared in your quarterly financial reports. So you'll see that at your next financial report in October. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Excuse me. Um, it's very funny that Jenny and I did not coordinate on this because she said a lot of what I already had planned to comment. I was going to talk about how um, we're not just books anymore. We're people and services and information. And I was going to talk about how this is really a fear of change and you can confront your fears and Fear of funding loss was a big issue, but we've already been through that in 2017, so I don't have to go through all that either. Um, so now I'm kind of rethinking my comments, but I want to mention how, as Jenny did mention, how we were considered non-essential. And I think a lot of that comes from that image that we have, which is kind of like a book, but to me, it looks like a stone tablet. And I expect we should have an ancient Egyptian standing next to it because it just looks like a stone tablet doesn't look like anything or anyone that we do at the State Library. So I'm really happy to hear that we're going to continue with this new image because I think that does reflect everyone at the State Library and everything that we do. So that was my big comment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about logos real quickly that they just become associated with something. You put it out there and it becomes associated. You don't have to explain it. I want to know how many people driving a BMW know what that logo is all about. It has a really good story behind it. I think it can, <laughs> um, but it's really good. But how many people know it? Thank you. Um, and other logos, I won't list them all. But you don't have to explain a logo. It's out there and people get used to seeing it. Um, the other thing I really want to mention this, and you really need to be concerned about this, is the internet is forever. This logo is out there on the internet because it has been sent out with every article, every comment out there. People have seen it already. And it's associated now, and it pains me to say this, with a commission who was afraid to accept it, afraid to change. Um, but you can stop that. You can accept this logo and you can move on so that you will not always be associated with that particular image that's out there. You can accept this image and be the commission that is brave and courageous and ready to move forward and take the library, the state library in a new direction. Um, be the brave and courageous and innovative commission that we have come to depend on in the past. You have always been really good. So do that. Um, the other thing I wanna say, and it really makes me sad to say that in all this discussion of the logo and the image, the words have not been mentioned at all. And the words of Montana State Library, a greater state of knowledge, 
just give me chills every time I read those because they are incredible. And I have talked to other people and said these words and they all have the same experience and reaction. It's like jaw dropping and mind blowing. And they say, that is powerful. And I say, yes, it is. And we are. So thank you. Pam, thank you for that. Would you just state your name again? And I'm sorry, Pam Henley, consulting librarian with the State Library. Thank you. Any further public comment? So we have a motion on the table. Uh, and the motion is to um, uh, advance the recommendations that the rebrand subcommittee has made. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, now we are moving on to the Digital Equity Act and Montana Libraries. Jenny. Thanks. Jenny, you just bring up the presentation. I'll, I'll guide you through it. So this is uh, information that's being shared with the commission. For your information at this point, uh, there will likely be further opportunities for libraries and the state library to support digital equity work across the Montana state. Um, but I wanted you to have some, some background information uh, before we reach that point. Uh, and I wanted to start with some history, uh, both for the commission and also for librarians who might not know about the deep history that the state library and Montana libraries have in supporting digital equity. Oh, sorry, I think this is you linked to the one that's linked in the agenda, not not oh, me. So sorry. Sorry. That one, yes. So I'm going to present the history, and then we have Kate McMahon who's going to talk about the, the Digital Equity Act that was recently passed by Congress. Go to the next slide. So to start with, I wanted to give you the definition. If you come stand here, they'll be able to hear you. Do you mind? The guys. Just... Okay. I'm going to run it. Perfect. Okay. So I wanted to start with the definition of digital equity um, because there's a lot of different language and terminology used when we talk about digital equity. Another term you often hear is digital inclusion. And the National uh, Digital Inclusion Alliance has a nice distinguishing definition between those two. Digital equity is really the condition in which individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed to fully participate in society. So it's really about how people are accessing the internet. Digital inclusion, which is another important component of the umbrella of digital equity and digital inclusion means that people have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to use the internet and the ability to afford access to the internet and so forth. What we're really talking about today is how people go about accessing the internet. I'm going to walk you through just a, a little timeline of work that the State Library has done in partnership with Montana Libraries dating back to the, the mid-1990s to help support digital equity in Montana. Okay, all right. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So Congress passed the Telecommunic Telecommunications Act in 1996. That was a, a major update to that act to acknowledge the role that the internet was playing in our society. And just as a little aside, it was about 1996 that the Montana State Library created our first website. We were one of the first agencies in state government to actually have a website. We used to 
help host and, and build and support agency websites in state government. Um, the Federal Communications Commission, which oversees the Telecommunications Act, also established the E-Rate Fund. Uh, e the E-Rate Fund is a, a service that, under the, the Universal Service Plan, that provides funding to help libraries afford the internet. And at the time, the, the passage of the act required libraries to create technology plans for themselves and that those plans be approved by the state library. So it was the state library's role to help work with libraries to create those plans and then adopt them to help libraries advance their technology services in their libraries. And we would also help libraries submit E-rate applications to help them supplement the cost of their internet. I was looking through some previous commission motions back in the in the mid nineties, and I found that the um, the state library had contracted with a company called InfoMind of of the Rockies to provide a two year contract to fund internet services for public libraries. Uh, that contract was for forty six thousand dollars and helped to fund internet services in twenty seven libraries, which I thought was pretty remarkable uh, at, at such an early stage in the adoption of the internet. And there you have an example of the, the state library's first website as it existed. In 1997, the State Library Commission uh, met to allocate $345,000 of our Library Services and Technology Act funds to connect an additional 51 libraries. And it was at that time that the State Library hired its um, two technology consultants. That was the first time the State Library had hired uh, technology consultants. Uh, Suzanne Reimer is one of our longest serving library consultants. She's been with us since 1999. One of the next big iterations in support for digital equity came with the American Re Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars, which were passed in about 2009 following the Great Recession. Uh, the state library received about $4 million of federal funds through the Broadband Technology and Opportunity Program to help provide updated public access computers in libraries. Uh, we use some of those monies to continue to support E-rate applications to help with internet affordability. Uh, we created digital literacy training programs in libraries and Jen Burnell, who some of you know, who's currently the administrator of the Montana Memory Project, was first hired at the State Library to be the digital literacy trainer using those kinds of ETOP dollars. Uh, we were able to provide different kinds of scalable training opportunities for libraries to help support patrons. We use the funding to create technology petting zoos. Some of you recall it was around this time that we were really going mobile and e-readers and Kindles and Nooks were really taking off and people were coming to their libraries asking for help using this kind of technology. And so we created these petting zoos to give librarians the experience in using this kind of technology so that they would be better prepared to help serve the, their patrons who are coming into the libraries. Over about 18 months of grant funding, 62,000 Montanans participated in the technology trainings offered by their libraries. And I included a link in your meeting materials to the executive summary from uh, that final grant program. Uh, in 2015, the Federal Communications Commission issued a modernization order for the E-rate program. And in that program, they created guidelines for libraries that provide suggested broadband speeds for libraries that say that libraries that serve fewer than 50,000 people should have broadband download speeds at at least 100 megabytes and libraries that serve more than 50,000 people should have uh, broadband speeds of at least one gigabit. Um, so these are not in law. These are suggested guidelines. They're not in any way required for funding, uh, but it gives us a way to measure how our service in our libraries uh, stacks up to these guidelines. And 
the reason these guidelines were created as they were was to recognize how important adequate broadband is to support synchronous use in library facilities where we have users using public access computers, staff using staff computers, people coming in and using the wireless internet um, to fully participate in online meetings, online educational opportunities, and so forth. In 2019, the State Library used some of our coal severance tax monies to fund a study of broadband access because we wanted to have a sense of how well Montana libraries stacked up to these new guidelines. And that report uh, identified the broadband speeds that exist in libraries. They also, that study also helped us identify what some of the barriers are that prevent libraries from having access to those kinds of speeds, which um, largely pertain to the, the cabling, the routers, and other kinds of equipment in those libraries that is outdated and not able to support internet speeds uh, that are suggested by those guidelines. Uh, that report also identified the fact that uh, in 2020, in Montana communities, the library was the only source of freely available Wi-Fi in 28 Montana communities. So again, when you think about digital equity and, and the ability of Montanans to go online, that's a really critical resource that's being offered by our Montana libraries. Uh, we also have a link to the, the dashboard if you're interested in exploring more information about the broadband speeds and, and other related information about Montana libraries from that study. Here, I think now very familiar with our hotspot lending program, uh, another very critical way in which Montana State Library and Montana Libraries is supporting Montana's abilities to get online. The program was initially conceived as, as a pilot prior to the pandemic. Uh, we were going to pilot the hotspot lending idea in the uh, Pathfinder Federation in North Central Montana. And very, very quickly, we found that uh, people were needing access to the internet because of the pandemic. And so we used some of our state funds and COVID related funding to rapidly uh, roll out that program statewide. So we currently have about a thousand hotspots circulating through public school and academic libraries. The cost for that program is continued to be funded through our COVID related funding. It costs about $40,000 a month to deliver those services. The state library owns those hotspots and we work under state of Montana contracts with Verizon and T-Mobile and, and Mimont to pay for the data plans so that uh, Montanans have access through those um, Global Wi-Fi hotspots. To date, Montanans have used nearly a given gigabit of data through those hotspots. And I included just a, a quote from one of the users there that illustrates the impact that um, those hotspots are having in Montana. One million gigabits. I think, oh, a million, sorry, it's one million. And then in addition to the, the mobile Wi-Fi hotspots themselves, some Libraries have also been lending laptops and tablets so that people have the technology to, to implement using the, the mobile Wi-Fi hotspots. And then based on the broadband study, we're also investing about $650,000 of our ARPA funds to address some of the cabling and router needs that we're seeing in Montana libraries. We call it our internal wiring project. Um, that study found that about 40% of libraries have outdated wiring and Wi-Fi equipment. Uh, so with the $650,000, we've been able to prioritize between 25 and 30 libraries to receive upgrades to that kind of technology uh, with the understanding that they will then invest in higher broadband speeds going forward. So just a little bit of a summary of how Montana libraries are supporting digital equity in Montana. Um, we're providing public access. Um, well, 
28% of Montanans don't have access to 100 megabits of broadband. That's that's in their homes. So um, more than a quarter of Montanans do not have access to sufficient broadband. All Montana public libraries have Wi-Fi. And in 2019, which was um, the, the, the most recent year prior to the pandemic that, that shows sort of normal library usage, nearly a million Wi-Fi sessions were used in libraries. Libraries offered 938 public access computers. In 2019, Montanans used those computers over 800,000 times. Montana ranks 13th for the number of computer users in libraries nationally. And last year, Montana libraries offered over 45,000 one-on-one technology assistance sessions to Montanans. I share this information again as a summary for the commission and, and also to remind uh, librarians that we have always been deeply involved in helping Montanans to achieve digital equity. And I'm excited about the next opportunity that the Digital Equity Act is going to provide to our communities and hopefully our libraries as community leaders will be leading the way. Happy to turn things over to Kate to give you more information about the Digital Equity Act. Hi, uh, my name is Kate McMahon, and I am a planning consultant. Um, I um, up in Whitefish, Montana. Prior to that, I was in Great Falls. Um, I've been doing technology and broadband planning um, in Montana and other states since 1997. And actually, a lot of the programs uh, that uh, Jenny talked about, uh, the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program, I was a grant reviewer for NTIA. Um, I worked um, with the um, American Reinvestment Act, doing regional um, meetings across the state on broadband access. Um, I've worked with um, libraries on and anchor institutions um, on broadband plans to upgrade their internet access. And I can't emphasize how important this is. And I think everybody, especially going through COVID and um, all these meetings and schooling and everything going online, just shows, um, shows that this is a moving target. Even though the library has been involved for 25 years with this and has been programmed for 25 years, um, when I did my first internet training at a library in Malta in 1998, we just plugged in a uh, copper wire into the wall and got, um, you know, I can't even remember, it was like 5, 15K or something down speed, you know, which is totally inadequate. But the applications are demanding more broadband. Um, our needs are evolving as a society. So this is something that we just have to be addressed on a regular basis. And the most recent opportunity is the Digital Equity Act. If you go to the next slide. Um, so the Digital Equity Act is actually part of the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act uh, that was passed last fall. Um, and within that uh, act, there were a number of programs that addressed the, what we call the digital divide. Um, the two that we're going to talk about today are the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment or BEAD program, and that mostly focus on the Digital Equity Act, the DEA programs. There are other programs out there that address the digital divide, um, but these are the two that the two on top are the ones we're going to focus on. So the BEAD program is a broad, uh, here's a typo, <laughs> Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. Um, this really focuses on infrastructure. Um, so this is, you know, getting the, the libraries of one gig to the libraries or for the smaller uh, libraries, the 100 megs or the, or the middle mile. The Digital Equity Act focuses more on skills, um, capacity, um, training, um, you know, those types of things. But they work together. I want to go to the, to the next step. Um, in order for the um, states to access those um, funds for the BEAT Act, they have to have, also have a digital equity programs in place. So they're linked very closely. They both have an objective to bridge the digital divide, um, to provide that digital equity, digital inclusion um, that Jenny um, talked about and defined in the first slide. The BEAT um, five-year plans are supposed to incorporate the digital equity plans. 
Um, so there, there's going to be some overlap between the planning teams. They want these two programs to be linked, to be integrated, to be complementary with each other. And both of these plans need to address anchor institutions, which include libraries. And libraries are probably um, the most important anchor institution that addresses specifically digital equity. The other anchor, anchor institutions, hospitals, local governments, schools, fire departments, you know, provide services, but libraries are, you know, at the forefront of addressing these issues and might have been since 1997. So who are your target population um, for the, um, these programs? Go to the next slide. Oh, I think, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I think I skipped a little bit. But anyway, the, before I go to the next slide, um, there are, um, like I said, significant funding in these programs. In order for the states to access these programs, they have to have five-year plans. Um, so the um, B program and the DEA program both included uh, grant money for the state to prepare these five years plans. Uh, the NOFO, NOFO uh, Notice of Funding Opportunity for the DEA uh, plan was issued in May. They were submitted, the state of Montana submitted its application um, for the planning grant for the Digital Equity Act in July. And they anticipate that they will find out in September if they comply with that criteria and the funds are released. So in September of 20, um, there will be a one year, if the state is successful, and we're gonna assume they are, there will be a one year planning process for them to develop a five year plan. So that means in September of 2023, that plan should be completed, submitted to NTIA for review. And again, if the plan is successful, then in 2023, um, the state would receive what's called capacity grants. And then those capacity grants would be used to implement the plan. Um, and so the libraries, um, you know, are if our, the libraries are identified in that five-year plan as having programs, um, services, um, they would that those funds would pass through from the state broadband offices to the libraries. The libraries don't apply directly, um, but they would be one of the stakeholders that would be part of that five-year plan. Um, after uh, the um, state capacity um, funds are um, released, then there is a competitive program uh, where the libraries could compete for those competitive grants, but it's really anticipated that most of the funding would probably come from those capacity grants. So this shows you that this is not just a one-year program. The first year is planning and then the funds for the libraries would be released in you know, the subsequent phase, which is a five-year phase. Um, but for the libraries to access those funds, they have to be very engaged in the planning process so that they're included in that digital plan. And then those funds can pass through to the library. So just to put a little bit more about the digital equity plans, the target audience, and this is the slide I was sort of skipping mm -hmm. ahead, so when the Digital Equity Act comes out, it has to specifically address these target populations. And as I read through here, think about, are these our populations that the library serve too? Low income, aging population, veterans, people with disabilities, rural inhabitants, people with language barriers, minorities, maybe not so much incarcerated individuals, but every other population that is required to be addressed in those digital equity plans are the populations that the libraries are already serving. So you can begin to see how important it is that the libraries be involved. And the next slide is sort of a, a summary of the types of programs that might be included in that five-year plan. Um, it would be activities such as digital literacy training, again, which the library is already doing. Um, applications and content on the website, um, you know, for uh, disabled populations. Technical supports for people coming into the library. Um, Jenny mentioned the petting zoo, just for me to learn, you know, how, how does my device work here? Can you help me out? That's part of it. Facilitating the adoption of broadband. Now we have the broadband, um, the BEAD Act, which is the infrastructure, but even if the infrastructure is there, not everybody 
um, can afford it. Not everybody has the skills to use it. Um, not everybody knows, you know, how to access it. Um, senior citizens in particular, they might be in an area that has very robust broadband, but they're they're just not skilled enough or whatever to actually get this in their homes. Um, so broadband adoption is important. Workforce development, um, you know, working with your economic development agency so that people have the skills to work online, to apply for jobs online. Most, um, when you talk to employers now and you ask them where they're advertising, it's not the newspaper. They're advertising online, they're advertising through Indeed.com and all these other websites. And when you fill out an application, you don't go to the job site anymore to get out a paper application. You need to do that online. So the workforce needs those skills to be able to do that. Providing equipment like the hotspot lending program, um, upgrading public access computer centers. You can go into most libraries um, you know, around the state, whether they're rural, whether they're Missoula. Uh, those public access computers are used heavily. And so this is an opportunity to expand those and upgrade those computers as well. And then also addressing privacy and cybersecurity issues. Um, you know, one of the concerns, I mean, for people going on is to make sure uh, that their information that they are sending over the internet is not secure, that that um, is, is not going to be hacked. So there's going to be funds for libraries to look at that as well. So the next slide. When they put these, when the uh, states and every, you know, 50 states is going to be putting together these plans, these are the things they need to look. They need to look at the barriers to digital equity. So it's access, it's affordability, it's having the skills to use it. It's not just one thing. They need to look at all of those uh, barriers. They need to have um, developed vision of what they want to do in their state and measurable objectives to see if they're they're making um, you know improvements. They need to look at a need assessment, asset inventory, which includes what are we doing already? What are the libraries doing already? What assets do they bring to the table? There needs to be a timeline for implementation and they need to coordinate it with the needs funding as well. So the next step, uh, slide. So the process is um, the states, when they put together these digital equity plans, um, it is required that they collaborate closely with key stakeholders, anchor institutions, and particularly the libraries. They need to have an outreach strategy um, to all different stakeholders in the group. It needs to be robust. It can't be something that just happens in Helena. They need to go throughout the state and talk to people and get that input. They need to coordinate with the municipal, regional, and digital plans. So the technology plans that the library already has in place. You mentioned um, needing to coordinate with county and city governments. Um, they need to do that. Like I said, this can't just be happening um, in Helen. And they need to reach out to all of these um, organizations, including workforce organizations and the institutions of higher learning. All need to be part of this digital equity planning process. So this is something that's going to start hopefully in September or in the fall. And um, I'm going to be working with the state library to get that information out and engage the libraries as much as possible. So, and I think this is, might be our final our slide coming up. So why is it so important to leverage the libraries for digital equity? I think libraries are the most important institution in this effort. They already have a track record, as Jenny demonstrated, of addressing digital equity. They already serve the target population that this, this grant is intended for. They're trusted institutions. People go to the library, they know where they're at, they use them, they trust them. And the libraries already have the resources. They have the physical meeting space. They have the public access computers. They already have the resource that the states can build on to implement these programs. So again, for these reasons, I think the libraries need to be um, heavily engaged and we're going to do everything we can over the next year to make that happen. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Does anybody have any questions for myself or Kate? Can I? No, no. <laughs> no it's okay. Um, are you then with the um, the Montana State Library here in the county? I'm like, I'm retired by yeah, I'm a consultant, and the and the library has contracted with the Montana Cooperative Development Center 
to help. Um, and I've actually been working with the library for the last year initially um, to help the libraries and um, provide technical assistance so the libraries could access some of the funds that were coming out through the ARPA grant and also through community development and some other grant programs. So this is sort of an extension of that work. Um, I am on contract with the Montana Cooperative Development Center, and then the library is contracted with them. And I've done, and I do work on a, a periodic basis with the uh, um, Cooperative Development Center. So that's sort of my connection. Uh, but I've been working in this field since 97. I'm um, really impressed. I'm like way ahead. Um, I just wanted to thank you um, as a senior. Um, what I have learned, my husband, I'm 73, he's 74, is that this society is quickly leaving us behind and making it more difficult for us. We can't get our Medicare, we can't get our Medicare, we can't get our any of our programs that we need, we can't even get a veterans program unless you're digital and seniors don't know how, and they have learned to frustrate us. And they have learned to say no and no and no. And we just kind of throw our hands up because even driver's licenses are different. And in everything for seniors and the fact that you are making this, it almost brings tears to my eyes because I think you will, we feel like we're lost and given up on and you are doing an incredible service to seniors. So please make the library, that, those are some of the people I know who depend on you for their very, needs and it's a wonderful thing. So thank you. Yeah, um thank you. Thank you, State Library. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my my question is so so if, will there be a person in the library that we can go to that people can go to? That's a that's a really good question. We don't yet know how the the funds are going to be deployed. The, the plan that has to be prepared in this next year uh, is intended to identify exactly who the partners are and in what ways those dollars may be shared, whether that's through the state library or directly to individual libraries and how those individual libraries might then be able to use those dollars. Certainly one of the needs that we hear regularly from libraries and, and is identified in the broader sense, the lack of technology expertise in some of these small rural libraries and so the more capacity that we can bring to libraries, we know that will that will benefit everyone and, and is necessary. So that's one of the points that we will be making to the state as they lead this planning effort over the next year. I mean, it's bizarre what things for seniors. I mean, we had to renew our brand and we only 10 acres, but we have a brand that provides by MSU graphic kids and we had to renew it and we can't get it in the county because it's now all with you and we couldn't get the we couldn't get through the digital world to get our brand ready. And, and like I said, that's all very difficult these days for people who don't understand and you learn to do it one way and then they change the software and oh yeah. Right off. <laughs> Again, that's very frustrating. That's why like the constantly change it's not a one time infusion, we've done it, you know, we've upgraded our data and we're done. This is uh, something that needs to be built for us. So, um, Kenny, and if I could, uh, this is Elsie. Yes, so, Kate, please. thank you for your presentation. Um, has a letter of intent then been gone forward? Superintendent, the Department of Administration is taking the lead. And they submitted the the DEA application that was due on July 12th. So that has been submitted. Excellent, excellent. And um, our understanding then, um, just in reviewing this, I'm doing a lot of work in the broadband area, as you can understand with education. So trying to glean any kind of opportunity from the federal government um, is, is what we're also looking at. So um, we should know by September, just on a timeline review again. That's right. And, and then okay. uh, my understanding is that the state will uh, have an advisory group of stakeholders like education professionals and librarians and, and other appropriate partners 
to advise on the creation of that plan over the next year. Excellent, thank you. And we're looking at a possibility of 600,000. Um, and yet that's just for the planning grant. So that's just the to planning. devise that one year plan. And then based on what's in the plan, uh, the funds that would be distributed to implement the plans would be determined. And okay. that'll be in the millions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Report. Um, Jenny, let's move right into your state library report. Yeah, and I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm, I'm going to quickly go through some of these, and so please stop me if you have any additional questions. Um, the work plan dashboard is there and available for you. This is the closeout of our FY22 work plan, and so in October, uh, you can expect a presentation from Rebecca on our FY23 work plan dashboard and some revisions that she's bringing to, to that work. So I'm excited to share that with you in October. Uh, we have finally concluded negotiations with Cersei Dynex to continue to provide the platform for our Montana Shared Catalog. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we're able to move forward without the need to migrate to a new system. Uh, Amy Marchwick is available. If you have any questions about some of the new services that will be available to our Montana Shared Catalog libraries and patrons, including access to a, a children's OPEC that libraries are excited about. Uh, the initial years of the contract have a cost savings. I'm looking at Amy, remind me it was about $70,000 less than uh, what we're currently paying. Yeah, $64,000 we're saving in the first year. In the first year. So uh, able to negotiate some reduced costs in the first years. This is a, a five-year contract that we negotiated with them with the opportunity to renew up to 10 years. Um, briefly on the, the flood and space planning. So we are currently out of about 80% of the library. We have about 20% of the library that was not impacted by the flood. And we're gonna be doing some rearranging in that space to, to make it more usable for staff who need the ability to come into the library um, rather than working remotely and to also have some space for our IT staff to help support some of our technology equipment. Uh, at this point, Belfour has completed the stabilization of the library. They have removed all the carpets. They've completely dried the concrete subfloor. They have made flood cuts in the drywall in the impacted space about two feet high. Uh, again, in about 80% of the library. So significant impact overall. Um, it, the space is stable. Some of the space is being used to store some of the, the physical property of the state library. Decisions need to be made about how the state library space is going to be restored. And, and some of those decisions are impacted by space planning that's going on across state government as the state looks at supporting more telework and having a reduced physical footprint. So there's discussion about um, potentially moving the state library to other places, bringing in different occupants into the state library. The Department of Justice who shares space in our building is interested in, in moving into our space if other space for the state library could be located within the Capitol complex. Because the space planning process itself is still being evaluated, the state anticipates that in the next couple of months, they'll have better information about what kind of square footage might be available across the state capital campus to make these kinds of changes to the state's overall footprint. And so the decision has been made by the governor's budget director and the state architect and the head of general services to wait an additional couple of months before deciding how to rebuild the state library space to make sure that how they do so meets future needs of not just the state library, but state government. So at this point, it sounds like they're not going to put out any kind of bid packages for the restoration of our space until some of those decisions can be made. And then at that point, they'll seek contractors to rebuild 
the, the library in some form or the space that we're currently occupying in some form, uh, they anticipate probably at least six months from that point to get the work done. So we anticipate that we will not be uh, in that location for six to eight months optimistically at this point. So, so you know, our staff continue to work remotely. We have some staff who've asked for space where they can come in so they don't have to work from home. We think we can accommodate that within the state library, but insurance will allow for us to rent space if that becomes necessary. So that's something that we're, we're working on. Just want to um, acknowledge the state law library also in our building who's been very generous in providing space for our staff and some of our IT equipment. The State Historical Society is storing some of our artwork, including the painting that George Van donated in their art vault. So that is secure. So we're we're doing the best we can and, and making the most of it. And then, of course, as I mentioned in uh, earlier this month, we're just incredibly grateful to have executed the contract with the state of Utah to be able to continue to support our talking book services. Um, those patrons would be without that, their services at this point had we not executed that contract. So just amazing. That, that that has rolled out so smoothly. You have some books or no, some materials damaged. Were those any of the things from the courthouse rooms or any of that? What type of material and where do they go to fix it? That's a good question. Um, so we have the state library records uh, that we have to maintain for a certain period of time according to state records management practices. It was a we lost about six boxes of records. And then another half dozen or, or so have been sent off to um, freezer storage where they are essentially freeze dried to try to um, restore them. I haven't gotten a report back from Bill for about the status of those documents, uh, but these are all state library records that were impacted. So they weren't like the research on the environment that you have, or the, they weren't that kind of value. Right, exactly. Not, not, not the those. history of the library, but yeah. Um, I did provide any materials, just an update on the status of our talking book services contract. We had a meeting with the Utah State Library staff last week to talk about how things are going. And um, things have rolled out just remarkably smoothly. Um, the, there's been some transition for patrons as they get to know new readers, advisors, and we've been able to address any questions or confusion that came with that immediate transition. Um, one of the things that we're continuing to monitor is just the availability of titles. Um, one of the reasons why we wanted to go with the Utah Services is their ability to provide more titles at once because they're currently using, utilizing the duplication on demand services that allow up to five titles to be sent per cartridge and then they send patrons up to five cartridges at a time. So the, the available volume of books that patrons are receiving at once uh, is has increased through this contract. Just wanted to acknowledge that the continuing education task force work is rolling out. Kelly Barco was at your meeting in June to talk about that effort. And Robin has agreed to serve on that task force as the commission representatives. So that work is, is commencing and we'll be working with librarians to continue to modernize the, the CE requirements from the state. And ultimately those recommendations will be brought to the commission for adoption. You have in your materials a, a memo about the Federation Study Task Force. Uh, and just to remind the commission and, and for Tammy who wasn't with us in February, Tracy Cook presented on the history of federations in Montana and the need for an opportunity to study uh, the purpose of those federations, how well current federation practices are meeting legislative intent and the need to study how we can improve upon the, the work and uh, nature of those kinds of federations. Our hope is to launch a, a, a task force later this month uh, to begin that study and again any kind of recommendations for legislative change or other recommendations for how we uh, provide funding to the federations require their funds and service etc would come to this commission for approval 
Is this the one you wrote me about being on? Kenny, we did. If you're, in, uh, if you're interested, Kenny and I have spoken about you serving as the I'd commissioner. I'd love to be on this. Okay, with you, Kenny. Yeah. And, and Kenny, Kenny had um, suggested that you serve, so I think that's agreed upon. And then this includes two trips to Vienna? <laughs> we'll have to talk to Chair Beanie about getting that for the budget. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe you're going to be in. Uh, <laughs> Elsie had to leave the meeting just so you guys know. And then we have the, the, the partner feedback and news to know about if anyone has any comments. I, I know that was really quick. So if you have any questions or comments about anything I reported or or other things you'd like to know about, please let me know. I had something on the news to know about. I have to look that up. I have a question here. So let me look it up. I couldn't get the Missoula one because you had to get the Missoula newspaper to see it. Did you guys have that problem? Yeah, the one on the side of being winning the award. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Was and good. you got to look at it. Your report. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have a condition. Yeah, I tried and it said you had to buy a subscription. Oh, yeah, I'm on it right now. Oh, my Yeah. 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 I know what it was. I visited last night with, um, is it Jim? John, John, about this. On the news, welcome to the 21st century. That was a phenomenal, just a phenomenal. I wish everybody could see that on what libraries are doing. And, um, we visited about this briefly, but in Bozeman, they started, it started with giving out lunches to kids because they'd come to the school. It was on the news and they were hungry. And so they started putting out sack lunches. And of course, the schools do that to some degree, mostly, but the library started putting out sack lunches with fruit and juice and they pack it up for them. And then they report on the news about two weeks later that they decided, you know, people were just coming in and eating it. So they were giving them out, they just had them out front and they were giving them out non discriminately to anybody. And then the homeless were coming for them. And, so the Bozeman Library was sort of wrestling with how much. And I noticed that was an issue in in some of this. And I had I was so torn because I not he talked about that they're recommending library libraries get social work. And um, I just am really torn. And I wonder when you talk about the future of where libraries are going. I mean, Bozeman's got a food bank not very far from the library. Yeah, now, and the school three blocks away that for life lunches. So, at what point uh, does that become social workers become the job of the libraries? And I, I think that is such a fair and important question, and one that that libraries are wrestling with. We've seen, especially in some of the larger urban libraries, where they have hired social workers because they they are serving populations who need the services that can be better informed by social workers. Um, I personally wrestle with that same question because I'm concerned that other entities that should be fund, providing the services are being defunded. And so people who would otherwise rely on the services are then turning to the library and the library is, is bearing the cost. Of the of, of some resources, so that so I wrestled with that personally. We had a conversation with the Network Advisory Council about a year ago when we were talking about sort of the core services that we were supporting, and uh, we had a conversation about whether those kinds of social services are core services in libraries, and and we decided at this point that they're they're not, and we're not as a state library investing in those kinds of services. But it's something that we are mindful of and and pay attention to and think about the needs of our users and, and how they're using libraries is something I think we Because about a week later, then they ran another article on I three, four, it was a news in Bozeman, three, four, something, yeah, somewhere had picked up the Bozeman idea and they were trying it. 
um, Bozeman was finding when it was just for kids, they could get a donate. But when it became for anybody, including all the homeless adults, um, then people weren't giving the money. And so they were, it's a tough issue. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but it's something when you talk about down the future, it's not all digital. It's people's really basic needs sometimes. And is that going to be our job and see reaching out for it? Yes, and I, I needed to make a quick note about the time of our session tomorrow. It's at 11.15. I think I put in the agenda 11.30, but please note that it's actually at 11.15 over in the holiday, and I think it says in the agenda the room name uh, for the session. I don't have it off the top of my head. So again, this is an hour-long opportunity for people to come and be in conversation with you about questions they have about the state library and an opportunity for you to hear from them about operations in their libraries, concerns that they might be having. I think tomorrow is an opportunity for us to maybe delve a little deeper into some of the questions that Tracy brought to you, the concerns that we're hearing in libraries. I would encourage us to focus on those kinds of concerns. You have a chance to hear firsthand from people who are attending about what how those concerns are playing out in their communities. Yeah, we'll kind of be in a in a panel style format and, and people will be in attendance. I also think it's an opportunity for us to talk about the freedom to read statement uh, and again to ask questions and, and hear about the importance of that statement to libraries. There are a couple of other um, topics that we've been talking about the continuing education revisions as well as the Federation study. And so both Filet and Tracy will be in attendance in case people have questions that they want to bring there. I will, of course, be uh, in attendance as well. This is typically a well-attended conference session. So I look forward to some really um, engaging dialogue with the people that are there. Time is correct on the calendar, but it doesn't have a boardroom. The Montana boardroom. The Montana boardroom. At the Harvey. And again, I want to apologize to that lady, and I would write her that I felt like she's saying something she wasn't saying. So I'll make that from Jennifer. Mm -hmm. um, Look like I'm nice. What's our feeling? Yeah. That uh, was the one we saw. Oh, I, yeah. I see. Yes, well, you something. Sorry. All right, guys, I will be brief and quick. Uh, the subcommittee has built a performance evaluation platform uh, that models the state's evaluation uh, system. We're working with Sharon Hardwick, the state of Montana State Library. HR representative to gain access to talent. Um, we're going to incorporate a 360 review process, which allows the commission to receive, to collect feedback from um, parties outside of individuals who are working directly. So we can get a broader uh, evaluation of the state library. Christian, can you hear him? Yeah, it's a little struggle. So sorry, Dalton. <clears throat> Kristen, where I was at was uh, leading off with we are implementing a 360 review process, which will give us the ability to have a broader spectrum in our evaluation. As many of you know, Kenny will be leaving us um, in an earlier conversation with the commission. Um, Robin is expressing interest in replacing him on the subcommittee. Um, and she, she did agree to that. So, um, as we move forward next week, we, we will reconnect and um, discuss implementing it and moving this forward. It is our goal to have this completed by the October uh, commission meeting so we can meet as an executive session and review um, the feedback and uh, discuss. Within the performance evaluation 
Are there any questions? Fortunate to have someone with uh, HR training doing mm -hmm. this with us. Thank you. Okay, um, fall federation meetings. In the interest of time, I wonder if we can handle that via email. Um, we have those meeting dates in your calendar, and we'll reach out to commissioners and see uh, who might be able to. We'll reach out to uh, commissioners to see who might be able to attend. Um, a couple of those fall meetings typically happen online as opposed to in person, so we'll send that information to you as well. Okay. For those ones, Tracy was talking about. Right. No, um, no, 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 these are these are the six regional federation okay. that meetings that are there in September and early November. Okay. Or mm -hmm. We just typically have a one commissioner try to attend one of one of the okay. meetings. I did not know that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um so that leads us to our final action item, which is uh, electing new commission officers. Uh, in our last meeting, um, Dalton agreed to stand for election as uh, commission chair, and Peggy agreed to stand as vice chair. Um, so I just want to ask now if there are any other nominations for uh, chair or vice chair. Nominations or self-nominations? Okay, hearing none, we'll take these uh, one at a time. Uh, I'd like to ask for a motion to um, accept Dalton as um, chair of the commission. We'll start beginning with the next meeting. I and I would second that. Thanks, Kristen. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations, all. Congratulations. <laughs> and now we'll do the same for Peggy. Motion, please. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Peggy, for aye. Say aye. 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 Sorry. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Congratulations, Peggy. Do either of you want to have your acceptance speech? <laughs> uh, the acceptance speech will be tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I um, just want to open it up one more time for public comment on any matter that's not in this agenda and that is within our jurisdiction. Public comment. I just want to sincerely thank Kenny for his leadership. He served nearly six years on the six. State Library Commission. Oh, um, nearly. <laughs> six <laughs> years. And, um, you know, just so appreciate all of your thoughtful leadership over all of those years, especially as chair. Uh, and we're just thrilled and so excited for you in your new adventures. And I, I do hope that we can come. Meet you in Vienna and learn a lot from wonderful <laughs> European life. I know that we have a, an amazing connection with you that, that does not go away. Just you're you're not in Montana anymore. So I look that. And we look forward to celebrating your send-off a little bit later this evening. And I just want to remind everyone that the Trust for Montana Library is holding a reception. Um, it'll be in the boardroom here at the, the library about 7:30 tonight. So to wish Kenny well. I thought it was okay. Okay, well, it seems my gavel has already been taken. Away. <laughs> Sorry, a lot in the flood. <laughs> oh, no. <It's> okay. <laughs> okay, well, this meeting oh, no. <laughs> now adjourned. Thank you all.